Colleagues, I welcome you at our final session of the 27th Bathhouse readings, which are happening online and are dedicated to the anthropology of violence. The preceding sessions which we had, 22nd, 23rd of May and yesterday, they were dedicated to the violence of state uh, the violence of state versus society, and there were wonderful discussions, important, um, speeches, uh, talks were made, and today our session dedicated to culture, how culture works with violence, how it translates the ideas of violence into the society or deconstructs them, and how by studying culture we can understand, get into the anthropology of uh, violence. And happily, I pass my the word to our first speaker, but I want to remind to everyone who is watching us today uh, that you can actively ask your questions on YouTube uh, and make your commentaries because after each talk, it is our tradition, we are g giving all grounds for discussion. And now, uh, happily, I'm passing the word, which is Andrei Zorin, a uh, uh, professor of Oxford University. Thank you so much. I, I love to participate even in such uh, um, format. Every person who heard about Tolstoy heard about uh, non-violence. Every person heard about uh, violence, heard about Tolstoy, heard about non-violence, and this is this word non-violence is connected to Tolstoy, as the, uh, Andrei Balkonsky with war and peace, and he uh, that all uh, he, Balkonsky was saying that from non-violence all the commandments of Christ can be deduced, and he thought that. The, this commandment of non-violence, it has an absolute character for, for Tolstoy and he, you, you cannot diverge from it in, in, in no case. Not for any kind of justice, not on a th life threat and uh, or, or threat to innocent lives. And in here, which is important, he was, well, Tolstoy was writing about the absolute character of violence in the idea you should not compromise because compromise is inevitable in practice and that's why you can't compromise in theory. This is a very important distinction. Why shouldn't we allow compromise in uh, theory? What is the relation between theory and practice? The ideal, according to Tolstoy, any ethical ideas, it is an external state which is not achievable for the human being in real life. The essence of human li ethical life is the effort which uh, we are following to along these st stairs from the closest to the furthest point. It is the ethical effort of self-education, and that's why the absolute the absoluteness of uh, principle of non-violence um, it is opposed by the hierarchy of forms of violence uh, in accordance to be approximateness to this ideal the main evil of violence is not caused to the victims of violence because to die because uh, be because uh, because, because of violence is not evil, to die is not evil. It, the main evil is done to the soul of the violator himself. And that's why the criteria of the building of this hierarchy on these di di different stages of evil, it is the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of repentance. The more violence uh, gives us a chance to uh, repent, uh, the, the, the more uh, ability of salvation we have. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the harder the violence is, the more the violator is, in, <coughs> is um, 
is uh, the more violator is convinced in his own right. This, that's why the criminal uh, pa uh, violence is more forgivable. That's why he has a lot of repenting sinners and uh, criminals. The, uh, the next stage is, are the violators by order. <coughs> Those who vi violate by order. For example, the executioners have more uh, chances for salvation than soldiers because the executioners uh, know that their craft is uh, condemnable, while soldiers think that they're acting by own orders. Uh, and the bottom and the bottom of this hierarchy of this uh, vortex is uh, is occupied by those who give orders to kill or to violate. Those are the lowest. The prosecutors, the lawyers, the generals, the ministers, and first and foremost, the czars. In the utmost cases, uh, the, the, the czar is the utmost point of uh, moral moral uh, refu re refutation, uh, uh, because he also wanted to write a story about the uh, uh, repenting Tsar, he wanted to write about Alexander II, but Tsar was occupying the lowest place. A separate place is uh, given to the revolutionary violence, because on the one hand, uh, the terrorists and uh, revolutionaries are convinced in their right to kill, and that's, w that's what places them uh, at the very bottom of the hierarchy. But on the other hand, the society refutes their violence, and that's why uh, this is a semi-rehabilitatory -re factor, where uh, and in this uh, passage of uh, so social refutation, they can find a way for repentance and for paying for their sins. And this is dialectic, dialectics of violence and repent repentance is uh, uh, being unfolded in the, in the last period of his life, where he, when his philosophy was fully formed and after the death of Dostoevsky, which is very important. In, the, in Dostoevsky's lifetime, Dostoevsky was viewing that as, as his uh, as the sphere of Dostoevsky. Um, I won't be talking about his reaction to, to Dostoevsky's de death, but now he understands that he has to work on this problematic by himself. The late prose of Tolstoy is full of uh, uh, episodes from criminal uh, chronicles and criminal killings. Uh, if, if we compare it linguistically, it's just the whole, uh, the rate is very big. But the, his, yet his basic intuition connected uh, with, with violence and non-violence were formed very early in his f first draft of his first one of his first stories, uh, the raid. Uh, he, uh, uh, his character is asked why you came to Caucasus to the Caucasus. I wanted to know. He answers why people kill each other. Violence was. He, a turbulent uh, theme for him. It was one of the main subjects of his reflection. And the, uh, he, the final stage of his philosophy of violence was formed in 1857 in his Parisian uh, journey where, where he looks at the uh, public uh, execution and he writes to the Dr. Botkin. He writes, if someone tore a person in front of me by his bent hands, it won't be as horrible as that elegant m machine through the help of which uh, a, a, a strong and healthy person was killed. When a person is torn by bare hand, it's not a rational will, it's a human passion. But here it, it's just a comfort in killing and nothing uh, and nothing sublime about it. it it's, the, uh, it's the arrogant desire uh, to perform God's will and human acts in the name of God. And it's a wor worse. It's worse than the act of violence in the fit of passion. I'll just speak about one episode uh, of uh, War and Peace, a famous pre-death uh, story Platon Karataev uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, told to Andrei Balkonsky, and then he also turned it into a fairy tale. It's about a merchant who was uh, who was falsely accused by a criminal. Uh, he uh, he put a, uh, an axe, a bloodied axe, under his pillow, 
and uh, Tolstoy uh, and this merchant uh, was uh, uh, they took off his nose and then he was exiled for 10 years and then he um, uh, finally meets his uh, the criminal and an old man tells his story to his own accuser to his and he says uh, he, and he says, I don't, uh, I don't um, repair, uh, I'm not sorry about anything, but, but my, my wife and children. And suddenly this criminal gets so shocked that he repents. And there is one more small uh, minor detail. Platon Karataev, as he was described by Pierre, cannot repeat anything. He, he all, always speaks in proverbs. And when Pierre, amazed by his uh, by wisdom, Platon is never able to repeat it. Uh, but Pla this time, Pla uh, Pierre, Pierre heard this six times. Uh, he, for six, six times, uh, and he was able to repeat it. Here's the slide with the translation. So the the criminal, the, the murderer repented, and the old man says, God will forgive you, and we are all sinful in front of God. I am repenting my own sins, and he wept bitter tears. Well, and what do you think, my dear friends? Uh, Karatev continued, his face brightening more and more with a rapturous smile, as if what he had to tell contained the chief charm and the whole meaning of the story. What do you think, dear fellows? That murderer confessed to the authorities. I've taken six lives, he said. He was a great sinner, but what I'm s s more sorry for this old man. Don't let him suffer because of me. So he confessed, and it was all written down, and the paper sent off his due form. The place was long far off, and while they were judging what with one thing and another, filling and the papers in all due form, the authorities, I mean, time passed, and the affair reached the Tsar. After a while, the Tsar's degree came to, to set the merchant free and give him compensation that he had been awarded. The paper arrived and then began to look for the old man. man. Where is the old man who ha has been suffering innocently and in vain? Uh, a paper has come from the Tsar. So they began to looking for him. Here Karatev's lower jaw trembled, but God had already forgiven him. He was dead. That's how it was, dear fellows. Karatev concluded and said for a long time, a pure soul was dimly joyful and Karatev's face, he told, and the mystic significance of this joy was the most important thing. I want I want to pay attention um, to the six m murders. And it, it's a repetitive uh, figure because uh, on, the, on this, and the, uh, Karataev, uh, uh, and the seventh time when the, uh, the seventh uh, victim was the one when you repent. So it's an important mathematics for Tolstoy. Six uh, times Karatev tells the story, and on the seventh time he dies. Six times the murderer kills, on the seventh time she repents. But I won't be talking about it. Uh, and so the, this, it's a, what's important is the uh, soul of the murderer who repents on the seventh time. Uh, Tolstoy didn't want to, re that I didn't like to repeat, but this uh, story of Platon Karatev is probably the only example that, uh, of repetition. He wrote uh, uh, he, uh, uh, into a story, God sees the truth, but he waits, which is written from the third point person. There, is a, there are characters, there, is, uh, there, there, there was a very interesting discussion about it, uh, Young and MacLean, but I have no time to talk about it, but of, naturally, of course, it's a third uh, uh, person's narration. Something is missing. It's, it's, what's missing is uh, this st story of Platon Karavtaev smiles. Why is he this amazing, rapturous joy? Uh, and this story should be placed in the context of the whole whole uh, novel itself for Pierre who listens to the story when he gets captured by the uh, French uh, in within the flames uh, of the Mo Moscow burning uh, he, he sees the whole world picture is being broken in front of his face 
in front of his very eyes. There is no meaning in life. He sees living people who are turned into mechanism of killing. What is important in the world of in, in, in the peace and war, this uh, th thing ch we would change, uh, and that the war would become uh, the evil, most evil in human history. But in war and peace at the time, he thought that people are coming to fight, that that w w the uh, war comes not, not by order, not I. I won't be speaking about Tolstoy's philosophy of history. It is not this I, I, this decision of Napoleon and, and Alexander uh, w was not their decision. People came to uh, claim other people's territory, and people the others raised to defend it uh, by their own will, not by order. And this uh, meeting with Karataev is restoring uh, for Pierre the meaning of history. Uh, after, uh, uh, which was lost when he saw the m killings and the short shootings. So what is the meaning uh, of the smile? That, that the old man brought uh, the uh, living soul of his murderer to salvation. And this is what is kept in the later repetition of the story. But there is one mom very important moment here. God does not agree allow the authorities, the czars, the officials that are sending all pa uh, pa their papers that are ever... Uh, he, he does not allow them to participate in justice. They do, uh, they do, he doesn't give them right to correct their own mistake. This is a horrible irony. They wanted, they wrote, but they can't. They are not given that to be... Uh, to. Uh, to be to participate in mercy and god forgives that person before he leaves this life and the next uh, and the next episode in the novel it's the 14th chapter of the third volume sorry the 13th and the 40 this was the 13th um, uh, chapter and the 14th uh, the, 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 uh, the, the here of a place and uh, and uh, to your place and there is Napoleon's car carriage passing by. Thank you for your attention. I oh, I just was so involved into listening. Thank you. Ideal times, uh, timing. Thank you for the most important. Um, most interesting speech. What, what what would be of your questions, dear colleagues? Your opinions, probably commentaries. Um, thank you very much for this very engaging talk. And um, I apologize for asking in, in English. My Russian is that, a bit rusty fine. at the moment. That's, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Last time I've been in Russia was 2019, so that's two years ago, and that's always a bit too long. Um, but uh, what I would like to ask you um, is, uh, for Dostoevsky, there have been a few people trying to show that his um, writing on violence and his engagement with the topic of violence was really a very direct reaction to political circumstances, to Karakosov's attempt on Tsar Alexander II, um, to the burning of Petersburg, um, to the student revolts, and um, yeah, different um, different uh, events at the time. And I wonder, is is there any um, such direct link um, that one can show for Tide's toy? Um, also, um, uh, well, uh, very much so. Very much so. Uh, for the period between uh, 61 and 81, actually until Dostoevsky died, mm -hmm. Tolstoy mostly was in Yasne, living in Yasne Poliana, working on War and Peace, and then Anna Karenina and others. And in his traditional way of do, going against the current and against the mainstream, uh, yeah, in the time of the political upheaval uh, of 1860s, he detached himself, 
yeah, and started writing about the novel. And so for this period, when Tolstoy was writing War and Peace in his novels, uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, reaction is very much indirect. But after 81, he's very deeply involved in it. He's enormously interested in the revolutionary movement. After the uh, murder of Alexander II, he writes a letter to Alexander III and to Pobedonosov asking them uh, to amnesty and to pardon uh, the assassins. Yeah, uh, they do it with Vladimir Solovyov together without knowing each other. He believes that that's the only way to show moral greatness and to start the process of reconciliation in society. And, uh, he, and he was, until his death, uh, he was very much, well, uh, at least until 1905, he was very much interested in the revolutionary movement. One of the Tchaikovsky, he hired him as a teacher to his sons, and they talked about God and other talks. He wrote about revolutionaries in the resurrection, and in 1905, um, he wrote about them. And his last finished artistic work, Boshevsky Chalovichevsky, is actually about the revolutionaries. So, yes. Mm -hmm. And he, he wrote a lot of articles. Yes, he was deeply interested in political events. And terrorism was one thing he was uh, also very much thinking, uh, reacting, speaking about all the time. But uh, later than Dostoevsky, because I don't see in him the reaction on Karakosov crime, but definitely after the assassination of Alexander II. And I have this psychological feeling that he felt free not thinking about it because he knew Dostoevsky is doing the job. <laughs> After the Dostoevsky was no longer there, he believed now it's his duty to, uh, to go in. it. Thank you so much. If I may, I would like to write you afterwards and ask you for literature on this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Mikhail Nemtsev had a question. Thank you so much. Andrei Leonidovich, it's uh, to the latest point when you are speaking about the Tsars and according to, the, to Tolstoy, uh, that God deprives them of, of the right to repent and to participate in mercy. And, and uh, this is a, a very specific divine uh, punishment for the, for, uh, the Tsars. And so if you want to analyze this thought, that it means that God takes revenge, that instead of the uh, possibility, chance to the final self salvation, desires find themselves in the dead end. They, he, uh, he dooms them uh, to suffering. Why? And I think well, God becomes is a very a revengeful subject that gives uh, doesn't give uh, a, a chance for Tsars for their personal salvation. Why, why he treats Tsars like that? I'm saying this Platon Karataev is saying that. Uh, uh, Tolstoy doesn't say that. And I think that Tolstoy in 1866, that's what exactly, that's what he was thinking. And Platon Karataev is sort of his own li Tolstoy's lips, and w when Tolstoy rewrites this story, it's a, it's a third a third uh, person uh, story, and he takes away this smile. And by the end of his life, Tolstoy, he starts. He, he never finished this. He, he's, he's deeply interested in Alexander the first about about this uh, legend about his repentance and his. Um, uh, and in the story of our father Sergei, partly the, the, there was um, meditation on the possibility to repent, of the, of the inability to, re to repent, find themselves in this uh, story of Tolstoy. This, the, in, in the uh, mature uh, philosophy of Tolstoy, repentance is open to everyone, but there is a hierarchy of that, and the Tsars are at the bottom of it. And why? It is easy to understand, because they understand, they think that they have the right. They think themselves to be uh, chosen by gods, and they think and they are convinced that God gave them a right to judge people and sentence them to death and s decide on people's uh, fates. And it is much more horrible than you know, a murderer just killing 
by his own hands, the, he, then he can repent. Uh, the, the, the criminal, the, the executioners, uh, state executioners repent. It's hard, it's, but it's not impo uh, impossible. It's a very difficult hierarchy. Uh, but in, in the mature philosophy of Tolstoy, uh, it is never these doors are ne never closed for everybody. Uh, it, for them, but for the Tsars, it's the hardest way to the top. Within the frame of war and peace, there is a psychology of Psy Karataev, and his. It's it's for, for uh, Karataev likes to think that although he is very kind, he likes to think of the mystical judgment that the, 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 the Tsars think that they are. Ju uh, doing justice, but in fact, the justice is, is in the hands of God. And the uh, Alexander the first, who who, who w was mercying, uh, showing mercy over the merchant, he doesn't repent. He just he was acting on law. He sentenced a merchant and b by law, and then he found he he was innocent, and he and he rehabilitated him by law. Within that bureaucratic machine, there is no ethical uh, core. Uh, nobody say, is saying that they went to uh, pray to God, to the church. What have we done to, to, to a person? You killed, we judged you. You didn't kill, we, we release you and we uh, give you money for your suffering. So this is... Uh, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Andrei Leonidovich, it's a, it's very interesting, and it's very well built and beautifully. I have two small questions. There is a, a widely spread opinion that the uh, mature Tolstoy, later Tolstoy, is very different uh, to the uh, one, in, the early one in the middle one, to the middle one of the War and Peace, uh, because he became a moralist by the end of it. In in the War and Peace, he was not a moralist. 100%, and this is my question, my first question. Platon Karataev is, uh, is uh, reasoning, the, uh, reasoning the way mature uh, oh, Tolstoy, late Tolstoy was doing or not, and how would Dostoevsky comment upon this uh, fragment uh, extract from War and Peace if he had a chance to? Thank you for your question. Both of them are very interesting, but one is easy to answer, not because it's uh, easy to answer, or not because I thought about that a lot. I'm, I'm not the first one. This is a traditional uh, discussion going on among the uh, uh, researchers on Tolstoy. And Gustav just said um, there, there was no break in Tolstoy. There was a development, evolution. There was an evolution. He changed for several times, lots of uh, uh, inner crisis. Perhaps it was the ha uh, hardest one, but there was no break. There was no. In his later philosophy, he realizes the same principles as in the early ones, and from that from that on, I, th I think he he is very coherent. I think he was, I think he was trying to be more and more precise about principles. He had the same intuitions. Uh, from since early age, but he was focusing them more and more. The optics, he changed something, but his later philosophy is the crystallization of his intuitions, of the basic intuitions he had. Because he, the first ones uh, he, were expressing them most uh, articulate and uh, um, eloquent forms, and then he became very simple about them. But it's, these are the same intuitions, and I think I wrote that in, in, in the introduction of my book to Tolstoy, and I think that the uh, the wholeness, the integrity of his uh, of his path is unique. We're speaking about the contradiction. He was pathologically incoherent, uh, he, in, in integral person. That's why I'm looking looking for controversy because he was so integ in, in integral. He was so whole, and this, uh, of course, it's a Strange question, what Tolstoyevsky would have said? And here, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy would not agree. And when Alexandria Andreevna Tolstoy was reading uh, uh, the letters to her, 
uh, about the first basic foundations of philosophy, he was saying that's all wrong. He was saying Tolstoy was saying all wrong. Then he took uh, conf confiscated the letters. Uh, Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky took the letters and wanted he write to Tolstoy. It was about Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky saying all wrong about Tolstoy, but but he died. He never answered. He, uh, but un, um, unfortunately, we lost the possible discussion between Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, and it's a horrible loss for all of us and for the whole of humanity. But he never agreed, Dostoevsky. But first and foremost, with the probably top, uh, the, the nature of power and punishment, Dostoevsky believed, he thought that after all the breaks in his life, he believed in the necessity, in, in the importance of power. So, and uh, the uh, importance of social hierarchy. Leontiev was accusing him of sentimentality, but nevertheless, Dostoevsky would have never accepted that anarchic uh, model of Tolstoy. He he, he, he absolutely he treated it in a very dis different way the mechanic of uh, uh, physical violence. Uh, but Tolstoy didn't like Dostoy or his, he didn't like Dostoevsky as a writer. He, he thought he couldn't write. He doesn't write. He uh, write arbitrarily. His dialogue is wrong and uncredible. But as a thinker, he, he really, um, yeah, he really interested him and was very close. He, uh, he, when, he, when asked, what do you think about Karamazov brothers? He would always answer, there are wonder, many wonderful thoughts there. And, and I think that he was the, the difference and it was great. And I think that Dostoevsky would never have approved. And he, I don't think that, and Dostoevsky didn't like, uh, he didn't, uh, we don't know what he thought about uh, war and peace, but about Anna Karenina, he said, uh, the, it, it, it's, it's a repent, Levin's repent, repentance without church, uh, and he's being taught by a simple peasant, and a peasant cannot replace the church. Here is the Dostoevsky's reaction. And I don't think he changed. And, and he loved the people. Of course, Dostoevsky was the people's lover. He loved people. But I don't think that Platon Karataev would fit Dostoevsky's model of life. The, the, this kind of elemental kindness uh, outside the scope of church, outside of church boundaries, he didn't believe that. Uh, do we have any other questions or thoughts, commentaries? Do we have anything in chat? People, Carol, there are more, several minutes we have. I may. Thank you very much. I would like to ask one more question um, because um, how would you characterize um, Tolstoy's uh, own reaction? Because I, I, I'm, I'm not very well informed um, on these things. Um, but if I got the gist correctly, he was very much a reformer um, with his own ideas about peace, world peace, and um, his tendency that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, nature has to be preserved, um, uh, th that people should eat um, um, uh, no meat, things like that. And, and, and all of this works towards a reform rather than revolution. Um, and how, how would you characterize that? And um, again, I would be very happy if I could ask uh, you afterwards where I could well, read such you, things. Uh, you know, uh, of course, no. he was deeply against the revolution. And yeah, uh, it is a horrifying violence. And especially, yeah, and, uh, he wrote very explicitly about it. And especially the violence 
uh, yeah, based on self-righteousness and the belief you know how other people should live. For him, that was an absolute taboo. Yeah, and he accused revolutionaries of elitism and of believing that they know how uh, the people, the folk, should live and behave. He said, you can't, he wrote to them, agree with yourself. Even you have factions within yourselves, so you can't agree with yourselves. And you believe you can to impose your view on 100 million people who do not ask you to do it. And you have to murder and to do other things. So yes, he was 100% against the revolution. There is uh, no problem about that. Yeah, that's very clear. But at the same time, uh, speaking about him as a reformer, I don't think uh, a reformer is a good uh, word and apt because reform still believes some sort of the political decision from the authorities. Yeah, and he was very much uh, disinterested in politics, especially as a thinker. He believed that uh, uh, the only thing human being is responsible of is your own soul. And you should, the reform uh, should be absolutely limited to your own soul. And he, uh, oh, well, he was asked a typical question, yeah, everyone knows. Uh, he mm, believed there should be no sexual life, love, life at all. Yeah, he was against completely one taboo about sexuality. And he was asked many times, he said, the humanity is going to die out if people will follow you. And he had a traditional answer to that, you think less about the humanity. Yeah, humanity won't die out, yeah, just don't bother about it's none of your problem what is going to happen with the humanity. Your problem is to behave correctly and morally. That's your problem. And what is going to happen to humanity, that's not a uh, subject of your concern. And uh, that is, uh, was his traditional position. Yeah, and thus I would not define him as a reformer. He believed here yeah, in very strong moral imperatives and the beliefs and the necessity to improve yourself. And that's, by the way, when there is this political discussion, a lot of people justly say that Gandhi was Tolstoy's follower. But Gandhi believed he was a Tolstoy's follower. The, uh, yeah, they exchanged letters. His farm was called Tolstoy, as it is known, and whatever. But that was a very deep difference between them. Not only that Tolstoy said that Gandhi is a great thinker, but I don't like this Indian element, as he thought, because he was a complete cosmopolitan, unlike Gandhi. Yeah, but also uh, Gandhism was a political movement. And for Tolstoy, the uh, main effort was uh, uh, thinking about yourself and your own self. Thank you very much. That's great help for me, Greg. Thanks. Here is a question from YouTube listeners. Thank you so much for your speech. Can we speak about the similarity of Tolstoy uh, and Tostoyevsky for this uh, uh, for the ex for the exile? Uh, I don't think so. Parallels, yes. Uh, for the hard labor in exile, uh, Dostoevsky spoke about uh, the hard la the hard labor in exile. He spoke about this. The, letters from the death house the letters uh, it was tolstoy's favorite book he didn't like novels but that he liked he, he said that it was the most christian uh, book in russian literature not excluding pushkin but tolstoy in principle he didn't believe in punishment he category he stro very strongly believed of non-punishing criminals he didn't believe in punishing them and every exile and hard labor in it was just a, a form of evil for the mature Tolstoy and it, it's enough to read the resurrection to see that but for Dostoevsky 
the, this element of mystic rebirth uh, in crime and punishment, which it, to suffer and to go and go through the exile was an important thing. Я просто как-то подумала, что совсем в другой ситуации та же Зелем была Солженицына и Шаламов. Это, это интересная параллель. Это очень интересно. Я много думал очень об этой параллели. Она не, не стопроцентная, но это интересно. Это интересная параллель. И вот еще один вопрос, последний, да, тоже из Ютуба. Татьяна Борисова, скажите, пожалуйста, возможность раскаяния не приветствовала ли революцию, направленную против царей с неизбежным убийством одних, одними свежими людьми, других не менее свежими? Я не очень понял вопрос. А возможность раскаяния, да, ну, для преступников, да, имеется в виду, не приветствовали революцию, да, в каком-то смысле парадокс, да, не приветствовали революцию, направленную it's, против царя. Это парадокс. Нет, Господь ни в какой форме революцию не приветствовал. И э, э, суть, э, конечно, и возможность раскаяния, она находится ну, в совершенно понятном и обратной пропорции с тем, насколько ты понимаешь, что ты делаешь зло. Поэтому понятно, что у убийцы Ему легче осознать, что он делает. Убийц, который оправдывает и который считает, что не поступает правильно. Но все-таки он, так сказать, ближе к пониманию, что он делает что-то дурное. He's closer to understanding that he's doing something bad. He's closer to he's closer repenting to than a revolutionary. That he's thinking that he's sacrificing for others and killing to help humanity so in this respect uh, a revolutionary is uh, expulsed more than a murderer from society like a physical criminal uh, for Tolstoy when it comes to the killing of the Tsars uh, Tolstoy has a very curious disclaimer he does say that uh, Tsars do get killed some someone's killed I don't remember somebody was killed in the 20th century and he says well Why would we pity them? They just, the, the tyrants, even the kindest one, have murdered uh, thousands of people. And it, it, why would be pitiful? Uh, but we shouldn't kill them. It's bad. It's bad for your own soul, uh, first and foremost. Uh, but the curious disclaimer that he makes uh, is, uh, well, I understand the people that would be killing the Tsars uh, uh, due to personal evil. I... I would understand that if Lenin killed the Tsar because he was trying to take revenge for his brother, that's passionate, that's, uh, that's understandable. If he was doing it to liberate uh, humanity and build socialism, that's unforgivable, that's pure crime. Okay, so at uh, this uh, important uh, note, uh, well, it's not very optimistic, but still important, uh, I have to announced the first uh, paper, the first uh, discussion um, complete. Uh, it was a very live discussion and I would like to pass the floor to our next uh, presenter. And in just a few seconds, I'll be doing that. Uh, I'll just say that our second presenter is Evgeny Panamarov from the Institute of World Literature uh, of Moscow. An anthropology of violence in early Soviet literature is the topic of uh, the next presentation. Stay with us. In 10 seconds, we'll be back with the second.
on air. Irina, we will continue with our 22nd uh, bathhouse uh, readings on the anthropology of violence. Uh, going on to the second presentation of the day, let me remind you that it's going to be Evgeny Bonomirov from the Institute of World Literature of the Russian Academy of Sciences and his paper is on an anthropology of violence in early Soviet literature. Evgeny, the floor is yours. Uh, Evgeny, thank you. I will reiterate what Andre was talking about. Uh, it's amazing that uh, this conference uh, planned for last year finally took place uh, virtually, but still, I guess quality does not depend on the format uh, so much. Uh, and uh, thinking about my presentation, I continued to think about it uh, this morning still uh, in, in Krasnoyarsk, uh, where I'm currently at. Uh, this is uh, towards the afternoon here. And I was thinking that um, I shouldn't be limiting myself to just Soviet literature alone. I should talk about the Russian literature of uh, uh, the first half of the 20s uh, uh, and add uh, the migration reception of uh, Soviet literature. Otherwise, I will not be able to get to the bottom of the topic. So I wanted to expand uh, the theme of my presentation to cover Russian literature of uh, the 20s, uh, the first half of uh, the 20s overall. I will start by saying that early Soviet literature is uh, a way to verbalize and canonize uh, revolutionary violence. Uh, revolutionary terror becomes uh, a very important topic for Soviet literature. To a certain degree, Soviet literature has to explain to the reader, has to justify revolutionary terror that is uh, going full steam and it's not just about a pragmatic explanation like uh, terror is needed to defend the revolution, that uh, terror is a way to annihilate uh, the resisting classes, uh, uh, that it's a way to impose a new order because nobody is welcoming this new order. These pragmatic explanations uh, start to prevail as we get further away from revolutionary events uh, to the domino history uh, and they very soon become an epic uh, tradition in Soviet literature uh, 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 by 27, which is uh, the 10th uh, anniversary of uh, the October uh, revolution. Uh, the revolution itself uh, and uh, uh, the civil voice perceived as something epic. Uh, violence in the first Soviet text is uh, uh, presented as a value and a goal in itself. Uh, and here the temptation is uh, to describe revolution violence uh, as a sacrifice, uh, 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 as understood by René Girard with the sacred uh, violence. Uh, and this logic of sacrifice, uh, the way it's understood by René Girard, uh, well, you have to be given the gods of fate, uh, doesn't matter who, something that's not too valuable to preserve uh, the most valuable, to sacrifice the other, to uh, preserve yourself. Uh, this fight, the struggle against uh, bourgeoisie, uh, which uh, Georges Sorel was talking about uh, before the victory of uh, the radical social democrats in Russia, or continuing the uh, the line of the first presentation, Dostoevsky, in fact, uh, talked about, well, one of the few or perhaps the only one in the 19th century to indicate uh, that uh, terror and the socialist ideas uh, go hand in hand. Uh, the, this war against uh, the bourgeoisie uh, becomes this uh, huge sacrifice uh, for the uh, prosperity of the proletariat, uh, the working classes. Uh, the huge population of the country is now perceived as uh, the Greek format, uh, sexual violence, uh, liquidation of property, and uh, ridding them of their lives, in fact, and the, they go hand in hand. And it's indicative that uh, Bunin, uh, in, uh, when he's writing about uh, the Red Odessa, he's talking about the fact that expropriation violence uh, based on national uh, and class uh, characteristics uh, uh, is uh, practically identical, often leading to murder. The group of potential victims, uh, as Gerard explains, uh, uh, covers those uh, that uh, do not belong to the society, those that are marginalized, uh, uh, the potential 
victims, uh, people that don't have the rights uh, or liabilities. And if we talk about a revolutionary terror, they are consciously ridden of uh, these. Uh, the wording itself comes later, but uh, we don't. We won't have to wait long for it. Uh, just as uh, the concept of the enemy of the people, which is coined a bit later, but the, the essence uh, of ridding people of their rights or announcing people or class uh, against the law. This is something that we start to see uh, during the first uh, days of the revolution. Uh, not just talking about the October Revolution, but even during uh, February and March uh, in the current calendar, because the February Revolution happened in the last days of February. So. Uh, a police uniform was enough in the first days of March in Petrograd uh, to be killed in the streets uh, by the the crowds. Uh, that means everybody who was in one way or another associated with the police uh, were completely deprived of their rights. Uh, people that belonged uh, to state violence bodies. Uh, Gerard writes uh, that uh, this uh, Sacrifice uh, is not the same as revenge, it's the opposite of revenge, but what we see here, this is pure revenge uh, on the police uh, to get back to them at uh, the persecutions that uh, they were the hands off before the revolution. Uh, it's a different type of sacrifice here compared to, to the way it's described by Girard. Here I'm coming to the second point I wanted to make, uh, the cult of the victim emerges uh, from the very beginning of the revolutionary movement. Uh, the whole idea of the revolutionary movement uh, presupposes uh, victims and mass victims. Uh, victims fell. There's this famous Russian revolutionary song about uh, the fallen victims, uh, which uh, we heard during the first uh, revolution, but the versions uh, indicate uh, that uh, these are poems uh, from the end of the 19th century that uh, were merged together to make a song. Uh, this song uh, is an, a, a way to justify victims. It's a revolutionary hymn uh, and that's the way it's performed uh, in the early stages of the Soviet culture, for instance, in Maxim, uh, um, the trilogy, the movie, a trilogy with the The, the victims uh, that the revolutionary movement is going to make is a way to uh, for the society to pay for future happiness. Uh, but uh, the victim, uh, the, these are not uh, going to be sacrifices uh, that are going to be lost. Um, this is something that we trace in all of the early texts of the Soviet. Uh, a war from uh, Bilnyak uh, to Rusgrom by Alexander Fadeev. Uh, in uh, Fadeev's uh, novel, the more red uh, partisans are killed, uh, the higher the quality of the deed uh, that they represent. Uh, uh, there is an important correlation here, this important underlying logic. Uh, in the Soviet culture, the epic uh, understanding of the revolution and the civil war is replaced uh, by the epic perception of uh, the Great World War after the end of the war this idea of mass victims uh, the, the, in, inherits this understanding that the more victims uh, the better the bigger the deed the more heroic the deed uh, and uh, some uh, Russian historians uh, do want to exaggerate the people the number of people killed uh, during the great patriotic war it's uh, become an, an ideological question debated today uh, this is something that we've inherited uh, from the Soviet thinking this logic of sacrifice uh, the victim is no longer perceived as a victim it changes uh, representation uh, to something that's uh, quite uh, the opposite. Uh, uh, these are the sacrifices made by society for future happiness. Uh, uh, the victims uh, of uh, the bourgeoisie, uh, the red uh, compatriots that were killed, they continue to remain the uh, subject. Uh, they continue to fight and struggle uh, for the common cause. Uh, the victims talk in texts uh, that uh, they create uh, on uh, in Petrograd, in Leningrad, in the Mars fields, uh, with Lunacharsky's text engraved, uh, I quote, uh, 
it's not victims but heroes buried under this grave uh, not grief but envy ignites gratitude uh, during the red horror days uh, you lived and died beautifully this uh, willingness to act as a victim is considered to be the ultimate heroic deed uh, and this is something that's also inherited in the rhetoric of uh, the second world war the so soviet literature as has been noted uh, uh, by uh, philosophers uh, by migrants headed by Berdyaev. Uh, they indicated this uh, very often and Evgeny Dobrenko, for instance, uh, one of the most uh, well-known authors that were writing on Soviet literature, also talking about this, uh, Soviet literature would use the logic uh, by the, of, of, of switching the Christian myth, uh, the sacrifice of the Christ uh, is a victory over death uh, and these uh, sacrifices of the heroes of the revolution uh, is paralleled with the sacrifice uh, of Father uh, Christ. Lodachowski says, you rose uh, working in St. Petersburg, you, you initiated this war of the oppressed against all of the oppressors uh, to kill the essence of war, to kill war with war. And again, there's this uh, subtext of these uh, conquer death with death uh, from uh, these to solemn I can see that I'm running out of time I could give you more examples I would have to be a bit more concise uh, but I'll go over the main points uh, that I wanted to uh, deliver the victims of the revolution turn from victims into heroes uh, and even after their death uh, they continue to be the agents uh, of uh, the sacrifice those that were killed by the revolutionaries so uh, those that uh, were victims of the red terror they have no names or uh, they become nameless and erased from memory and uh, we can see that in the Mars fields. They, they mention names only of the red heroes uh, that are buried here in the Mars field. Uh, and this huge uh, mass graves uh, that everything started with during the first days of the February Revolution. Uh, the victims buried there, they have no names. Uh, these names are not engraved on the stones uh, uh, that uh, were set there by the Soviet government. Uh, very soon, uh, violence of uh, Soviet authorities itself becomes a huge taboo in Soviet literature. Enemies uh, will be handed over to competent uh, authorities. It's a euphemism for state uh, bodies of violence, uh, and their fate is never mentioned. In early Soviet literature, though, we do see scenes of violence. Again, uh, as an example, we can take uh, the Kedier by Pelnyak, a very interesting novel, where there's a, a number of uh, groups of uh, characters uh, broken down by class, uh, um, the aristocrats, uh, the working class. Uh, so everybody who was represented in the, uh, the Russian Empire, they're presented on the first pages uh, uh, of Pilniak's novel on the Civil War. All of the unnecessary classes are eliminated, uh, some are violently eliminated, uh, and the Red Army helps some of these disappear, others uh, unconsciously take their own lives uh, because they understand that they have no place in the new society. But it's interesting that the proletariat, or the working class that stays on Earth at the end of the novel, feels as if they were incredibly lonely. This uh, feeling of being left by God uh, is also an element uh, that we could uh, interpret as a switch of religious myth mythology into mythology that's created by early Soviet literature. I wanted to give you some examples, uh, analyze uh, an excerpt uh, of uh, Fedor Glitkov's uh, Cement, uh, where a communist is uh, supposed to send his uh, father away from home. Uh, there's an association with uh, Oedipus, uh, which is a very direct parallel in the text. I guess uh, there is no time left uh, for me to analyze this excerpt. Uh, uh, the next episode with the same communist, uh, he personally gives the order to uh, kill his uh, older brother, uh, to shoot him um, and when he takes his uh, brother to the shooting his brother talks to him this is extensive dialogue and they, they talk a lot so they even try to joke around uh, but we can see that uh, it's a, an attempt to, to sort of suppress fear in a way to hide it behind words some kind of magic uh, um, 
I, I guess, Irina, I need to really accelerate now, don't I? Irina, you have five more minutes. Uh, oh, okay, I've got five minutes, that's good. If we were to look at these uh, problems uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, white literature, we'll see that Bunin uh, uh, and uh, his novel uh, mentions the same uh, magical words, uh, the meaning of which uh, sometimes escapes those that are listening, but it's the style of communication that's important. Uh, an important phrase uh, in the cursed days uh, that I noted, uh, I will quote, uh, I have this pain next to my left nipple from such words as the revolutionary tribunal. Why a commissar? Why a tribunal? Why not just a court? Uh, it's just because that those that are protected by revolutionary sacred rhetoric uh, can be deep in blood to the knees. Uh, Bunin has a slightly different context uh, for this uh, discussion. He talks about uh, the lies and uh, the destruction of the words, uh, uh, according to Bunin, started with the modernist culture and uh, the Bolsheviks are inheriting the modernist culture. Uh, we can uh, quote uh, Zizek here when he talks about this break uh, between the signifier and the signified uh, and how they start to exist uh, ideologically separately. But going back to Bunin's text, we can see an allusion uh, to pre-revolutionary uh, tales of uh, this uh, by Leonid Andreev for uh, uh, the um, seven hung men. And again, this element of violence uh, comes to the fore. I'm going to quote, uh, seven that were hung, uh, you can imagine in a way, but try to imagine 700 people that were hung, or, or even 70. This mass nature of the Red Terror, this is, uh, I guess, the most important difference uh, between a sacrifice in the traditional culture to sacrifices uh, that you could imagine within the context of uh, Red Terror. As Girard explains, uh, these uh, sacrifices uh, have to resolve the conflict uh, to somehow calm the situation down. Uh, Red Terror in the country does the exact opposite. But uh, I wouldn't exclude the, the fact that those that were organizing Red Terror have this feeling that uh, the more people they kill, the more people they shoot, uh, the more reliable Red Terror is going to be, the more effective. Uh, the, most of them, I, I believe, believe that uh, Red Terror was temporary and it will end, uh, and this is the official Soviet uh, ideology, in fact, uh, it will be over when uh, we run out of enemies, but the problem was we kept not running out of enemies. Uh, and uh, the final points I wanted to make is uh, some side uh, themes. Um, when uh, Zizek uh, starts his book on violence, uh, he starts uh, to with uh, uh, talking about the zero level of violence, uh, that violence is always there in society and it's important what we consider to be non-violence. Uh, it's important to take into account the first four years uh, of uh, uh, the First World War with a huge amount of deaths, a huge amount of killings uh, that European humanity had never seen before. The Russian Revolution starts from that zero level of violence. Um, which uh, brings you to a very specific scale of mass terror. Uh, Lev Samoylsk Kleiman, one of my teachers, uh, wrote a book uh, uh, and uh, he taught me this anthropological thinking. He's talking about uh, his um, experience in the camps uh, and uh, he said that uh, being in a situation of uh, primitive uh, life uh, brings back a lot of prehistoric rituals. Uh, he's very convincing in what he says, he insists on it, uh, and serious anthropologists uh, try to contest what he was saying, try to argue with him, uh, uh, but I guess this is another side theme uh, associated with the Red Terror and the expansion of the revolutionary violence uh, in uh, the post-war Europe uh, when uh, immigrants uh, start to perceive violence uh, differently. Ivan Ilin's book in this uh, context uh, from 1925 is particularly relevant uh, uh, on resisting violence with force. Uh, 
he is uh, arguing with Tolstoy in terms of uh, the relevant political agenda. Ilyin's uh, character itself is very interesting. Uh, he was uh, a professor of law who suddenly turned into one of uh, the biggest uh, ideologists of the white movement, and the white movement does accept him in the status. Soviet writers as well, like Ehrenberg, uh, I wanted to quote, uh, but again, I'm running out of time, that have this opportunity to go to Western countries to talk about what was happening in Germany. Germany becomes the semination of uh, Red Russia in Europe, uh, in terms of talking about what's happening in the post-war Germany. and. Uh, He's also using expressionism, ex expressionistic formulas. Uh, he was uh, close to the art sphere and uh, German expressionism uh, w was something that he was very well familiar with. A bit later, uh, when uh, the canons uh, for Soviet literature was being developed towards the end of the 20s, uh, violence uh, is handed over to the enemy. You can see that uh, uh, in uh, Rasgram, um, with them torturing uh, partisans, uh, and uh, Soviet authorities uh, do not use uh, violence. Uh, uh, so this is the route uh, by Fadiev. Uh, early uh, Soviet literature is particularly interesting. Uh, unfortunately, the time limitations did not enable me to give you um, a more detailed account. Uh, at some point, I hope I write an article with uh, no time constraints and I will try to dive a bit deeper uh, and uh, approach uh, this uh, task uh, from uh, a multitude of aspects. I thank you for your attention. Irina, thank you so much. Uh, you have to write that article, definitely. I even know which uh, magazine it should be published and I have uh, no doubt about that. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Colleagues, does anybody have any questions? Andrei Zorin and then Mikhail Nemtsev. Andrei Zorin, uh, I have... Uh, it's a very bloody topic. I have a, a methodological question. Uh, you said that um, uh, the way you see victims, uh, you interpret them differently from Girard. So you talked about these uh, differences. The question is, why are you using Girard at all? Since you are highlighting the differences all the time. Uh, we could debate this uh, for a while, what Girard's model is about. Uh, but there are some traditional paradigms, uh, religious violence, uh, ideological violence. Uh, what's the heuristic meaning of using uh, this uh, sacred violence concept uh, uh, coined by Girard in your logic? That's what I would like to understand, if possible. Evgeny, thank you. I tried to understand this uh, concept of uh, sacrifice in traditional culture and uh, as a philologist uh, I sometimes uh, feel like uh, my anthropological education is not sufficient although that has always been a point of my interest uh, and at the European uh, University during my grad school I took a lot of anthropological classes, but it seemed to me that Girard, that's the paper that I could use as a springboard uh, to draw these parallels uh, between uh, the sacrifice uh, in uh, traditional culture and uh, red terror perceived as sacrifice. I thought, I thought it worked, perhaps it didn't. Before we give the floor to Mikhail Nemtsev, as far as I remember Girard, the idea there is that uh, sacrifice is chosen uh, by those uh, that are the beholders of power to make sure that there is no mass violence, this uncontrolled violence. Uh, you, on the other hand, uh, were showing that uh, in the revolutionary context, uh, we're talking about uncontrolled violence. Uh, that's then uh, taken on by the state, uh, but uh, these are definitely not the scapegoats that Girard was talking about. It's something quite the opposite. Uh, 
they provoke more violence from both sides. In fact, uh, Evgeny, you're right on the one hand, of course. On the other hand, uh, I think those that were organizing the Red Terror, uh, this, uh, they uh, peripherized uh, this whole concept uh, of uh, individuality. They have this class thinking and uh, the unit that they could work with uh, for them was the class, not the individual. If we take bourgeoisie as a class uh, and then the kulaks as a class, uh, those are the scapegoats uh, that uh, need to be sacrificed uh, in the name of future happiness. That's the way I think they saw this. Irina, uh, sorry, uh, I will just abuse my role of the moderator a little bit, uh, but to ask a quick question. Uh, you said that in the early Soviet uh, uh, literature, the red uh, victims were considered to be as agents and um, subjects uh, and uh, but, but what's happening during the second world war during the great patriotic war there are graves of the unknown soldiers uh, uh, with uh, the, the the agency uh, of uh, the the victors disappears uh, because the whole idea of uh, uh, a mass grave is anonymity and there are monuments uh, to um, unknown soldiers uh, so this concept of for the subject is taken away from your own in, in a way so how would you interpret this uh, Evgeny I think it's a bit more complex so uh, this is something that I should think about deeper I guess uh, because on the one hand there's uh, graves of the unknown soldier this is a concept uh, that uh, came about after uh, the first world war across all European countries so uh, in all European countries so uh, the graves of unknown soldiers uh, existed uh, and in Soviet Russia they didn't exist uh, because the memory of the First World War was uh, pushed to the periphery. Uh, Soviet travelers uh, wrote about uh, the graves of unknown soldiers first and foremost in Paris, uh, there's a grave uh, to unknown soldiers and in Berlin as well what they wrote was that uh, this is a military propaganda this is uh, a, an obnoxious cult uh, uh, created in order to impose uh, throughout the 20s and the 30s uh, to, to impose uh, the future war and this opinion changes uh, 180 degrees after the great uh, patriotic war of course, we do have the graves of uh, unknown soldiers, so uh, that's uh, a fact, uh, but uh, trying to remember everybody's names uh, and this idea that uh, all of the names uh, ideally need to be there, uh, engraved uh, or pronounced in memory. Again, going back to the switch to the religious culture, this is something that's also part of the culture, so how this on the one hand we have the graves of the unknown soldiers and trying to remember everybody's names this is a complex uh, I need to think about this first as a complex phenomenon Mikhail Nemtsev Mikhail thank you Evgeny thank you so much uh, for uh, a wonderful presentation but the Soviet writers guessed everything right about uh, this uh, graves of unknown soldiers it, it is a, a way uh, of uh, imposing the future war they were right in this it is propaganda military propaganda i was thinking uh, in this context of early soviet uh, ways to rationalize uh, political violence uh, how is the zubrin's uh, novel um the split uh, which uh, contains uh, both elements of non-fiction uh, written after talks with red torah uh, agents uh, in the Siberia in 19, uh, 2020. So uh, it contains uh, a direct way of understanding sacrifice as a prerequisite uh, demanded by the revolution uh, from uh, those uh, that promote the revolution. The main character perceives himself as somebody who needs to be sacrificed for the sake of the revolution because he's not good enough. Uh, Um, do, would you say that uh, this novel is not unique uh, and that uh, in early Soviet literature the theme of the sacrifice as sacrifice as the prerequisite uh, for the triumph of global revolution uh, is something that uh, emerges much earlier and uh, 
and it becomes a part of the political self-consciousness, self-identification of the authors of these texts. Uh, you're getting yes, yes, you could. Uh, we're not using the term sacrifice, uh, but uh, people that uh, devote themselves to the revolution and at some point they have to sacrifice themselves. Uh, particularly if uh, they start to doubt something during NEP, uh, new economic policy, this is something that uh, is part of a lot of literary texts. This is something that's a fact. Uh, in the contemporary St. Petersburg uh, uh, culture, in the Alexandrian theater, for instance, about a year ago, well, after the theaters were opened, uh, uh, Theodor Tosopoulos uh, uh, staged a play on exactly the same topic, uh, that the heroes of the revolution have to become the victims of uh, the revolution uh, in his manner, the Teresopolis is a very brief manner. It was very interesting to watch the play and the way the audience was responding. They had no idea what he was talking about, uh, for the most part, uh, because, well, they weren't ready for perceiving this play. I think it's a very important uh, issue how the, the Red Terror is uh, still something we haven't uh, um, understood and uh, for the last uh, 100 years uh, the society hasn't processed it yet uh, and I think there is uh, the risk of this being replayed. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why we're not able to process it, uh, we're not able to conceptualize uh, the events uh, of the time. Irina, Carol wanted to ask a question and then Ilya and we have another question uh, from uh, YouTube. Carol, please. I think Ilya was first. Uh, ladies first. <laughs> ladies first. No, uh, no, хорошо, если, uh, okay. Позволите, тогда я задам вопрос. If, if, if that's okay, I'll ask my question. Uh, uh, Andrei asked uh, a similar question, uh, and what I wasn't to ask about uh, is also associated uh, with well, I just wanted to make this more explicit, that the doubt uh, that Gerard adds uh, something to your logic, uh, I think it confuses us more than does something positive. It's sort of, for Gerard, a victim is required uh, to uh, emphasize the differences. Uh, it comes uh, as a product of a crisis. Uh, that's why you sacrifice uh, something that's uh, similar on the one hand uh, to society and different, uh, like a slave uh, or a military captive, a child or uh, an invalid, uh, uh, somebody who's like um, uh, blasphemous. How this can apply to the revolutionary terror? It's, it's really hard to understand. Uh, the victim is needed uh, to restore the differences. Uh, red terror leads uh, to eliminating these differences. Uh, whatever you think about this uh, classless society, the goal of terror was this uh, total uh, homogenization of social classes uh, with society, uh, socialism or uh, communism down the line, uh, uh, eliminating aristocracy and bourgeoisie was not supposed to, to lead uh, to the recreation of the previous system of differences. Uh, so again, it's uh, an ideological question and I think in your paper you were shifting uh, with your point of view. Are you perceiving this as, uh, well, like uh, re revolutionary red terror as a phenomenon of uh, the traditional society, or is it modernist? Uh, so on the one hand, uh, you said that uh, it, it was non-traditional modernist. Modernist violence emerges uh, from uh, this urge to normalize, uh, to, to build the political boundaries of the state, uh, which uh, pre-modernism, you can't really understand that the lines are too blurry. Modernist violence, uh, is an attempt to homogenize the nation, everything that does not fit, uh, all of the minorities uh, are deprived, uh, repressed, uh, 
expulsed, uh, etc. With the Soviet state, uh, violence uh, is an attempt not uh, to, to, to even everybody out uh, based by class, not by national principles. So I guess you need to revise this, uh, to rethink this in a way. I don't I don't think Girard fits in. Uh, he, he comes to the fore of the stage when you think about victims, that's the immediate association that everybody gets. But uh, I don't think he really fits into your logic. I think it's uh, confusing rather than anything. No, I don't think it helps clarify anything. And uh, talking about Girard and Zizek in the same domain, uh, with the exception of the fact uh, that uh, their names start with the same letter, I don't think it adds anything. The, the, the use psychoanalysis in one way or another, both of them, one the Phrygian, the one in the Lacan sense, uh, you know, but one is uh, based on the Christian tradition, Girard, the other one is based on the Marxist tradition. We perceive uh, the Soviet uh, civilization as going back to the archaic uh, concept. Uh, Klein, uh, in his uh, autobiographical publicistic text, uh, could uh, allow himself almost anything but uh, this way to analyze uh, the Soviet project as a way to go back to the traditional archaic uh, concept. I, I think that's questionable to say the least. Uh, at this, I'll end my statement. Thank you so much uh, for provoking uh, so many thoughts and ideas. Uh, Evgeny, uh, Ilya, well, you seem to have uh, merged uh, a number of my thoughts uh, uh, that uh, I mentioned. Uh, um, along the way and what I consider to be the most important. I think Girard is interesting in this context because, uh, well, uh, modernist violence, uh, what is that about? Uh, in modernism, there are a lot of uh, traditional elements in modernist uh, violence. Uh, you could have these traditional archetypes and they clearly are relevant if you take any modernist culture, you would be able to identify this uh, reproduction rethinking, reintroduction of uh, important traditional elements uh, that uh, go back to the ancient times. Uh, you know, symbolists love this, uh, but not just symbolists uh, can be discussed in this context uh, and the traditional culture, the way it unexpectedly plays out uh, uh, in the modernist uh, culture. Bolsheviks uh, headed by the literary thinkers like Lenin and Trotsky can also be perceived uh, as a modernist project uh, to rethink the society. And I don't think they're as far removed as you're saying. That's the first point. Uh, the second point, uh, I, I, I forgot what I was going to say to begin with. Uh, because, well, there are a lot of points that you made that I need to respond to. Let, let me just uh, think about uh, the second point that I wanted to highlight. Uh, nations don't build uh, modernism. Bolshevism starts uh, with uh, the denial of the nation and we can see that uh, come to the fore in early Soviet literature. Ilya, you getting sorry for interrupting you. when. I was uh, talking about uh, modernism. I wasn't talking about the aesthetic principles. I was talking about the era of modernism and the nations do emerge uh, uh, during the contemporary era uh, together with romanticism. Evgeny, you're talking about the new history, right? Ilya, well, I'm talking about uh, everything that uh, occurs in the first third of the 19th century after the French Revolution uh, with the modernity, uh, Modernité uh, and Romanticism, etc. Evgeny, well, I don't think it makes sense to talk about Bolshevism as uh, modernism because I think it's slightly different. Uh, I guess it's the next stage in development in a way. I think I missed something else in what you said. Uh, Irina, Evgeny, we've got Caroline, we have two questions. Uh, uh, from uh, YouTube, uh, so I guess let's just uh, 
be more concise in question and answers. So we'd like to get answers to all the questions. So just a few minutes left, uh, Carola. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I am listening to, I was listening to your talk again as a historian and um, listening as a historian, I wondered again about the influences between history and literature and some um, reception lines. And, um, and this whole concept of the martyr sacrifice um, is certainly something, yes, which comes out of Christian ideas, but it has been very prevalent already in the French Revolution. If you think about Jean-Paul Marat and, and his murder by uh, Charlotte Corday and, and the way then David represents this in, in paintings, and then is, is taken up, or I, I have come across it a lot in, in the first terrorists. Felice Orsini is celebrated as a martyr. John Brown is actually using uh, these images very much and, and also kind of in his letters um, uh, explains how he behaves just as the Protestant martyrs in, in England. In, um, and then uh, kind of you have the in, in whole of Europe, the revolution of 48, 49, where this is a very prevalent concept. And so I wondered if in the Soviet literature one can find traces of a reception history um, of kind of, because I would guess that, that people kind of knew these examples and, and that in some way one could play maybe with them. But I'm not sure, this is why I'm um, asking you if you've found any of such reception history. And um, the other thing um, I just wanted to mention is that um, my host father in Petersburg, um, a veteran of the Second World War, he he always um, observed that um, the way the European nations dealt with the dead in of the Second World War um, was quite different, and he always observed that um, in France and Belgium and England you had these huge planes with sing single crosses. Mm -hmm. And nations were trying to actually identify soldiers and their names and bury them in single graves. And he always thought this represented very much an adherence to the individual and, and kind of um, holding the individual up, even in these masses of dead, really. And uh, while he always observed that in Russia, this grave of the of the soldier of the unknown soldier was more common and there was le less of an endeavor really to in yeah individualize and and find the individual dead and uh, this for him was something very symbolic and i just wanted to to pass this on because yeah he was he was a very wise man <laughs> thank you Thank you. Um, going back to the French Revolution, definitely that's uh, an important point to make uh, because the leaders of the Russian Revolution, uh, as Mayakovsky said, uh, uh, were trying to pass as leaders of the French Revolution in a way they would put on the role and the Russian Revolution was perceived as the next step in the global revolutionary movement. And you can see that even in the renaming of the streets uh, of the biggest Russian cities when we started to have cities uh, streets named after Marat. Uh, if we talk about uh, perceptions, uh, 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 well, those that perished during the First World War in European countries, of course, uh, they would treat them differently, but uh, for the Soviet literature, it was uh, a single space of capitalistic Europe. It was uh, hostile, with the exception of perhaps Germany standing out. Uh, and, uh, well, as I said, uh, the, the, the the history of the First World War in England uh, perhaps is even more important. Uh, at least my friends, uh, uh, Richard, Richard Davis, for instance, uh, my English friends would say that uh, uh, the victims uh, of uh, the First World War perhaps even more important to us than the Second World War because there were more people that died uh, uh, from England. Uh, in Russia, the First World War was uh, a taboo topic, essentially. It was uh, not discussed. And those that died during the First World War, well, they died for nothing, those victims that lost their names. If we talk about the Second World War, it's a different approach. Uh, and this is something that we've discussed, I think, in detail already.
Microphone. Microphone, microphone, please. You are still muted, Irina. Irina, uh, let me just read the questions quickly. The question from Vladimir Grushev, uh, Panimirov's uh, paper demonstrates uh, how legitimation of violence uh, was uh, perceived as inevitable during the revolutionary years. And so now we're in a situation of reevaluating our values uh, in, in parentheses. Should that be taken into account? You've got to, I guess so. Unfortunately, a lot of um, Soviet um, ideological concepts uh, continue to find a place in our hearts. Unexpectedly, this comes uh, up unexpectedly when you uh, switch on the TV today, for instance, and I uh, am looking at this rhetoric of the Cold War. I, I think this is uh, there's some coincidences uh, that we're starting to see, and this is really hindering this process of uh, reconceptualizing the values. Uh, to rethink the values, we have to be objective, at least, uh, well, take a break uh, and catch your breath and look back a bit more objectively. The problem of contemporary society is perhaps we're not capable of it. Uh, we are on the, we continue to use the same rhetoric of legitimizing violence. Irina, okay, thank you. It's not a question, there's a comment, uh, but, uh, well, I guess it doesn't require an answer. Because, well, we did discuss Gerard, and partially this has been said already. Camilla Bruscalva wrote, uh, hello, thank you for your paper. I think it's important to note uh, that uh, in Gerard, uh, the victim uh, is a scapegoat, uh, a, a victim, somebody who's excluded from society. And this is uh, what Ilya Klinin was talking about. Uh, Evgeny, well, this uh, Oedipus uh, in the cement, so the blinded, the self-blinded Oedipus uh, in a novel. This is the victim. That's the scapegoat that I was talking about. Uh, I, I, I think these meanings can be found, but, uh, well, perhaps I need to rethink the structure. 20 minutes wasn't enough for me to make it all coherent. Uh, Irina, thank you so much. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to stop the discussion at this point because uh, we are a bit behind schedule. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, in 10 seconds, uh, we'll be coming back. We'll have our third uh, presentation, Mikhail Nemtsev, an independent uh, researcher, the ideology of violence uh, with Conrad and, the and Francis Coppola with his apocalypse. <laughs> We are continuing the final section, section of our meetings of anthropology of culture and violence, and we are passing a word to Mikhail Nemtsev, independent researcher from Moscow, Kurtz, the Apostle of Violence, Ideology and Violence in Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, and Francis Coppola, Apocalypse Now. Please, Mikhail. Hello. Thank you for the possibility to discuss some latent aspects of uh, contemporary civilizations, some invisible aspects. Uh, w and I want to go from, to pass from the Russian literature history to, to the uh, to the mass global culture and literature of uh, 20th century. And, that, and in that global culture, a man called Kurtz has become uh, one of the symbolical figures who is embodying, in a way, a violence in a special way. As we know, he uh, comes, emerges uh, in Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, 
that was published in 1899 on, and uh, for the modern man he is more well known as a character of the film Apocalypse Now by Francis Ford, by Francis Ford Coppola. I am starting with a very uh, short uh, resume of two of these two works of art. I don't want to analyze the l literary piece as a literary piece and film as film. I am interested more what courts can tell us about violence or what rather what uh, the conception of courts the thought that stands behind him can uh, tell us about the role of violence in the contemporary civilization but i first need to have an overview of the two works in the no novel we have these uh, events in the colonial africa in the short story have in the story and the main character that happens to be in the place of action it is uh, Congo, the free state of Congo, the uh, Belgian um, Belgian co colony, and our main character goes up the uh, up the river. He is the captain of the ship. He has to deliver a group that has to save a, an, an agent that is in the uh, far post, and that agent is slowly uh, dying on his way back, and he. Uh, gives to the ma to the captain as a kind of treaty uh, uh, based on his experience and Marlowe the narrator comes back to Europe to civilization and he visits uh, the bride of courts who's 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 incognito in in but um, he calls her my turn Coppola uh, reproduced the fabula of uh, Cart of Darkness, but the action takes place in the south of Vietnam uh, du during the hybrid war, war because we, as we know that uh, uh, American war on Vietnam has never been officially declared. It was an, a difficult anti-guerrilla operation he comes to some with some secret task uh, to, to some kind of uh, patrol uh, boat and his uh, task is to kill the uh, the mutiny colonel who declared himself god and he has to be exterminated and here the american uh, uh, officer gets a task to kill the american officer he's re and the and Kurtz is killed and during his uh, murder he is being translated on radio and, and these translations uh, are, are resounding across the film and in contradistinction to um to the no, to the story uh, the uh, the film doesn't have the comeback uh, the return uh, the uh, it ends uh, at the scene of with the scene of murder and i would and I will always have to switch from one text to another, so seeing Kurtz as, as a kind of cultural myth, because the text of Heart of Darkness is a well-known uh, in the Anglophone world, uh, Western world. It's, it's, a, it's a character that overstepped the borders of the initial work, and it can be discussed, it can be discussed autonomously. Uh, from the circumstances described in Heart of Darkness. And so, we can, what, can we disca describe the situation uh, uh, that Marlowe talks about? How, can, can we, dis can we dis see the situation as war in, Af in Africa? Yes, it's a colonial war. Of course, it's an undeclared war. And the idea, uh, ideology of colonialism rejects war as a state, and it's very state of affairs. It's important uh, for uh, the text to to identify so something happening in Africa as war can be done only by the reader. But but for the people who are discussing uh, uh, European coloniali colonialism, it's not war. It's a pro civilizational process.
And here in Africa, Marlow, the main the narrator, sees that the uh, the whites are totally in advantage in the means of violence and suppression. <coughs> but they, they always they always the threat of revolts remains, and he always undermine underlines the fear of the white minority that the uh, local population would revolt revolts. And that's why they have to be held in the suppressed state. That is why the, the language through which they're described, they're described either as captives or as the war allies, or they are adversaries, were adversaries, uh, who and are against the colonial su supremacy. And all the campaign uh, is, um, is aimed at uh, extracting ivory from the colonels and the merchant ex expeditions are in fact uh, the military expeditions and Marlow in, 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 in case of um, uh, Heart of Darkness and the captain and the officer in case of uh, Coppola they are moving up river and that's how we learn about courts uh, courts First, we have some rumors. We are actually experiencing the increasing interest because this man was able, in a special way, to serve to solve the problems that are raised before everyone. They they are skeptical towards everything which what they see around. The, 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 you, the, the, you see the quotation. I won't read it. Uh, the, the scenes they see, their readers are skeptical. So they, the uh, first is uh, Heart of Darkness, and uh, Apocalypse Now is also into letters A, a now, and and Marlow is very for him it is very important to be psy psychologically stable, and he's very clear in his mind, and that's why he hears. Uh, count, uh, count, how counter uh, to everyone else, and his um, and the other <clears throat> character is more vulnerable to the influence of Kurtz because he's psychologically more vulnerable. And so, what we can say about Kurtz? Kurtz is first comes as a voice because first what Marlowe learns about him, he hears him and in the film apocalypse now the first cap uh, uh, introduction of uh, C captain willard to his uh, future target colonel kurtz is when he he is listening to his radio program they are both kurtzes are um, preachers uh, and the voice has as a quality uh, of hierarchy. It, it is able to suppress. One person is talking, the other is listening. And nobody is suppo supposing the answer. Then Kurtz is, uh, we find out that he's a most, uh, the most, a most effective agent or a most effective officer. He's uh, executing his duty to the uh, to the best, better than everybody. And at the same time, he becomes a traitor. And a strange uh, controversy here is that uh, for him to become more effective uh, uh, execution of his mission, he, ha he has to betray or, or, and to, to start his own game, so to speak. Kurtz is an agent of civilization. We can call him methodologist of civilization. It is less noticeable in Apocalypse of Apocalypse Now, but Conrad is really putting a hard stress on that. Kurtz is writing; he's writing a certain treaty, uh, which was ordered to him uh, by Society of Extermination of uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, be of beastly rituals, and it is uh, written in a most flourishing language. And it end, is ended with a famous phrase, uh, exterminate all the brutes. I, 
the translation of this phrase how to how it is to it, it is a key phrase to all this treaty because because it opens up it reveals the real attitude of course to the ab aborigines among whom he is working and whom he is supposed to enlighten in the film uh, this this phrase is reproduced in a different form bomb and kill them all and we know that there is an alternative ending to the film sometimes this film it is it, it's a, it is a separate theme the versions of apocalypse now in one of the versions there is an alternative ending and where they actually bombed them and the whole camp of Kurtz and his and the, the, the his adepts were uh, 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 adepts uh, were killed and w w Willard uh, actu actually executed the order co that courts gave him method um, Kurtz is a methodologist of civilization, humanitarian expert in Africa. He appears as a preacher. Colonel Kurtz served in Vietnam in certain medical medical divisions. They were vaccinating the population. And then Kurtz is turning mad and his um, authorities are calling him uh, mad. His, he, his methods were unsound. There is a lot of translation to this word. In, in any way, Kurtz found a way to perform the task uh, that he was given, but the method of how to do it, or how to solve these tasks, were, were, were unsound. They were not were unacceptable, because Kurtz is dealing with the main controversy of the war that he found himself at. It it is it was a war where the uh, where the very um, uh, instrument uh, it uses violence is always rejected always written off it's a, the, the violence has to be minimized it has to be legal and it has to be directed to the better purposes its final purpose is enlightenment education and reformation of the local life for the better but um, but uh, all, but those um, tasks can be achieved uh, only through the indiscriminate violence, with and that's why, and so that's how civilization becomes violence and dest destruction. And the last phrase that is being uh, said by Kurtz in Apocalypse Now, his final phrase in his um, um he he's, he has his radio translation when he's being killed by millard we're teaching young men to exterminate them by people by fire but their uh, commanders don't let them write fuck on their planes because this is indecent and that's and that's how courts uh, is actually if erasing the controversy he becomes an ideal uh, subject of colonial war and his uh, his very image shows itself that the, the uh, glo effective civilization is achieved by the dis indiscriminate violence this is uh, the truth of colonialism truth and uh, which is embodied by courts and that's why he beco becomes his existence becomes into intolerant intolerable for his authorities he acquires a superhuman status in as conrad writes about it he, he, this he writes vaguely he achieves his own um, becoming divinity himself and the local population in africa perform performs certain uh, rituals where he accepts uh, the worship and in vietnam courts becomes a military leader with absolute power <coughs> Kurtz uh, simultaneously is a preacher He's, he writes he, he speaks Colonel Kurtz and he, in Vietnam he uh, has uh, radio translations and he solves his tasks his own tasks uh, in uh, the first Kurtz uh, of Conrad achieves the task of the utmost gain gets the uh, most ivory 
he he's the uh, most quality qualitative agent best agent and uh, colonel kurtz in coppola is effective in his anti-guerrilla warfare he's formally accused at the uh, 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 in the killing of double agents but it become becomes uh, a, a, an instrument in such a warfare because you, the killing of double agents is the instrument in such a war and also he creates tra traditions in africa courts which we can gather that from the book of joseph conrad he has uh, and and wandering Russian uh, s s sailman uh, sailor becomes his, sorry sailor becomes his adept, and in with Coppola, it's uh, a woman who is waiting for him in Europe, and he will create a cult for him. Oh, sorry, it was Conrad, a woman who will create a cult of him, and in uh, Coppola, it's a journalist. It's a, actually journalist. It's a um, borrowing from uh, the Russian sailor, but hasn't Willard become what his pupil? Because in an alternative ending, he performs uh, the Kurtz's order. He bombs. He gives an order to bomb uh, the camp of Kurtz, and and he tells the story. He he's bringing the news back to this to, to civilization, and. It's and uh, apparently he uh, he stops being uh, an officer. He says, "I'm not serving in this army," and he, in a way, continues with his uh, with his course. In which way we don't know. And post mortem fate of uh, uh, courts in in heart of darkness, one should pay attention to it. Conrad really paid a lot of attention, a lot of importance to what happened to Marlowe after his return to Europe. He wrote that that if it was not for Marlowe's return and his conversation to this woman, all this book would have been an anecdote about a person going mad. But on his having come back to, from Africa, Marlowe goes to that woman who is waiting for Kurtz and she he founds out that she would might become uh, an author of her heroic myth this is a, a, a very t important textual moment she asks him to uh, pr pronounce the last words of uh, this dying man his that groom who is an embodiment of all that it is the best in humanity and Marlo having to hide from her suffering from having to hide from her who he really was the last words he said was your name but the but the reader knows that it was horror what he says so her name was horror but this woman we would become a hair uh, of course, he came as a preacher to, of progress to Africa, and one of the characters is quoting him and the, the uh, ideals with which he came, and he left pupils after him, and so he um, he's sort of dissolves himself in the uh, European culture of the 20th century, he is showing that there is an irreversible ambiguity in the beginning or that is hidden in the beginnings of this european culture the necessity of to civilize the world uh, corresponds to uh, or uh, in uh, with to, uh, and relates is related to the maximum of violence this is incriminate vi violence it can be instrumental to the process of civilization and Coppola might, might have not thought of Kurtz in this way, because he was had different tasks. But but Conrad, that's how he was thinking about it. And I think in this way, Kurtz is an interesting figure for our understanding of how civilization is constructed. This here, I want to um, finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you for your most interesting report. Colleagues, do you have any questions? Any commentaries? Евгений Пономарев and Carol. Thank you, Mikhail. It's an interesting comparison. I wanted to uh, focus attention the, on the fact that uh, Heart of Darkness is seen by many post-colonial uh, researchers as a post-colonial text. And apoc Apocalypse Now can also be viewed in uh, this tradition of post-colonialism. Post-colonialism is supposing the confrontation of two cultures. There is an anti 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 antithesis between colonial, colonial, colonialist and the colonialized. And does this antithesis have any bearing to your ideas? Uh, it's, an, it's not post-colonial, it's anti-colonial, because post-colonial uh, appears after the process of uh, the, after the process of decolonization, and for Conrad, and he was writing from within. In, but in fact, there is a se separate discussion. It was initiated by a famous report, Richard Chebua, about che about uh, the uh, image of Africa, where he criticized Conrad as an apostol of apostolus of colonialism and he sh showed that the text uh, the, the, the text that was supposed to be anti-colonial anti -colonial is actually a manifesto of colonialism and it was an interesting discussion and I think that Achebe is an interesting uh, discussion Achebe was unjust to Conrad uh, Conrad was not anti-colonial or pro-colonial. He was, he was interested in philosophy of individualism, but because he was an, an, an acute observer, the very description of the reality of African society and the scenes, uh, in the local scenes became the, uh, the uh, uh, became uh, made this text into an anti-colonial text just through, through acute observation. But a big problem for both works here uh, is the lack of the overview, uh, the, uh, the, the lack of attention to the other. And post-colonial studies are about this attention to the other, the the both uh, heart of darkness and apocalypse now we are only seeing every, everything through the eyes of the representatives of conrad himself the representatives of chain of no, noble cause we, the uh, how the voice of of the african of course the africans are talking there but their uh, observation their uh, is lacking there and apocalypse now they actually they're primitivizing uh, primitiv uh, primitivizing the local population Conscien they're doing it conscientiously one of the uh, members of the sh uh, com uh, uh, one of the members of the ship is being hit by um, uh, a sparrow but sparrows were not used on that war it, and it's a direct quotation but, but a quotation to, of the pre, uh, primary text, but to show that it's a primitive uh, population that lives here, there. But in this way, we can see it as uh, these are two as postcolonial works, but a very important important criteria of belonging to the postcolonial literature or decolonial art is not is not uh, observed. So that is why I don't think this. Postcolonial Carol. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. And I would like to use the opportunity to ask you something that I've been thinking about for quite some time. Um, and I would appreciate your opinion on this. I mean, Kurz is a German name, meaning short, <laughs> basically. Okay, um, I, I can and I, I always wondered, um, uh, and, and I wonder what you make of this. Um, because in a certain way, I, I wondered if 
Um, this is an allusion to, to German philosophy coming in. I'm thinking uh -huh. of Nietzsche or, yeah, kind of uh, this very closeness of civilization and violence, uh, which which uh, was addressed also in his his work. So I wondered if if uh, there's any any context again in this way, especially because Conrad is a Polish author, writing in English but Polish, and at least kind of in in German. Uh, history now, um, it, or German history now stresses the continuities really be between colonial policies inside Europe, mm -hmm. um, kind of, uh, yeah, used by uh, empires, um, the Austrian Hungarian Empire, or, um, yeah, the Russian, the German Empire, the German being comparatively small, but still kind of having these colonial and using these colonial policies um, in its peripheries, uh, which would for Germany be the Polish areas, um, Elsass-Lorraine, and also um, the Danish, against the Danish population in, in Schleswig. And uh, so I wonder if, if there's any connection kind of between um, Konrad being this Polish author and uh, him thinking about colonial policies and uh, Kurtz um, mm -hmm. being given this name. <laughs> okay, uh, so well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Kurtz as <laughs> just if, if I can comment on the biography of a fictional character, uh, he was, uh, um, his mother was French, his father was German, he was educated in, uh, in uh, England. So, um, Conrad says of him as, quote, all Europe contributed to formation of Kurds. He is an European par excellence. In this sense, he is kind of a guy of no nationality. He's a European, you know. And he works on behalf of a company stationed in, in Belgium, right? So, and in Europe, he, in, in Africa, he represents uh, European civilization. So, I think his nationality um, doesn't matter a lot here. So, uh, for, uh, for, for Conrad, he was a representative for Europe, Europe at large, not just a certain country. Um, well, um, it's, you know, it's very easy debate whether uh, Conrad, what actually did Conrad think about colonialism? It's interesting because he was born uh, in exile. He wasn't born in exile, but he spent his time in childhood uh, in exile in, in a deep in Russian Empire with his father. So his father was a Polish uh, Polish revolutionary, and uh, his opinion about Russian Empire was very ambiguous. For example, he is. It's known that he he could understand Russian, but he he you know. Um, tried to, 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 like, to present himself as a, purple, as, as a person who has zero knowledge of Russian, although he actually had it. <laughs> so his relation to Russian Empire was ambiguous, and uh, his relation to colonialism is ambiguous as well. So the heart of darkness begins with kind of you know, uh, discourse of the main protagonist. He looks... Uh, Mm, every uh, well, you know, uh, several guys are sitting somewhere on a, on, a, on a ship stationed in Thames, and he looks around at London and Great Britain, and he speaks about you know, once it was a dark, uh, dark part of the world, but eventually, with this uh, influx of civilized people, it became a part of the world civilization, right? But this. In the structure of the big text, all these uh, discourse about the um, about uh, you know um, advantages of colonialism of colonization looks like ironic ironic comment on what happens next because the whole story uh, shows colonialism as a very terrible thing and you can't you can't you know. You can't understand it in a different way. So for him, everything that happens in uh, in Africa is a crime. It's a terrible crime. So this uh, in, this uh, introduction about colonialism is very ironic. He actually describes Britain as a result of colonial process in the past. 
but the colonial process in the in the, in the present in Africa is like you can say nothing good about, it, right? So so his attitude in this in this way is ambiguous, and there is a discussion about him. I personally think that Conrad had no uh, definite opinion about colonialism because it's my like it's my personal opinion. I think he was individualist. He's all his uh, characters, they uh, somehow represent his thoughts about ethics of individualism, right? So Marlowe is a very, very strict uh, ethic rigorist. His, his, his ethics is very rigorous. For him, uh, people are separated on those who can do things and those who can't. Whether they are Africans or Europeans, it doesn't matter. He deals with those who can do things and with those who can't, uh, who can't make it. So uh, he, I think he had no definite opinion about colonialism in general, but speaking about African free state of Congo, he obviously was, his opinion was very negative, but it's obvious if you read the text. So this this internal ambiguity in his attitude to colonialism as as, as a part of, of 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 contemporary world makes this text more difficult to understand. That's why people uh, have all the discussions. What actually did he think about colonialism as as political practice? And it's hard to answer. I think I suppose he didn't think a lot about. It. <laughs> But that, that's my opinion. I could prove it, like speaking about Lord Jim or some other novels of Conrad, but mm, it's out of the discussion for today. <laughs> okay, so thank you for your question. We have two questions from YouTube. And I would I like you to answer quicker, but we, because we don't have much time. Olga Nanurova, if we speak about visual uh, portrait of Kurtz in uh, his in the uh, movie, it's already made, and uh, the reader in the book, the readers have to construct them. What does it give us as a figure of colonial violence? So, I don't know because the uh, characteristics of film as a medium they presuppose the visualization the ready-made visualization. I, perhaps what's important is that in the movies he, he appears as a voice with which Willett uh, finds himself in dialogue without seeing the carry of this voice. And during the, uh, the physical introduction, and uh, he also, Kurtz appears very gradually from the dark, and he appears as a figure talking from the dark, and he's gradually appearing on the shot in this scene, uh, giving the spectator to, uh, to, be, to construct his image in the process. I think uh, that the, here is, uh, well, it is a question of the characteristics of different media. Tatiana Borisova. Um, so, uh, following Caroline, please tell, please tell to which extent, uh, today colonialism, are there many colonialists in Europe, in Condor, or they, they, are, they are different? So, the, the question, there are there is a discussion. It's, uh, uh, it's in the chapter of in internal colonization by Alexander Atkin, Atkin, dedicated to Conrad. To which extent Conrad was, was a colonialized subject himself because he is a uh, he was he originated from the inner colony of Russian Empire. He was he's a person who changed his language twice and and lived in a country of his own choice. And he uh, spent a lot of time at the colonial uh, margins in his most important periods of his life. 
and he described those margin, mar, margins and the situation at the colonial margins were was a repetition of um, uh, situation in Poland but I have to say there is a lot of literature dedicated to that but I think that there is no dis, uh, decision to that because it is only for us that this dimension of colonialism and non-colonialism is a decisive fact but for Conrad had other dimensions for example him being part of our aristocracy that placed him in the in the uh, rows of the elites of Europe he's a, he has his own emblem he his noble birth is so important <laughs> for him uh, how, how was it important that he belonged not only to colonial culture but to Britain as a colonial culture which was an example of um, uh, uh, an enlightenment government of colonies in contradistinction to Belgian Congo there are so many dimensions that have to be analyzed he saw himself as a British citizen which is an enlightened citizen uh, but there is no final answer to that if I understood the answer asked question co correctly. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to our uh, reporter, well, to our speaker. We will continue. Uh, Ilya Kalinin. Ilya Kalinin, he is uh, from High School of Economics of the the journey from Moscow to Russia or organization of transgression. On air. If we colleagues, uh, we continue with uh, our section on the anthropology of violence and culture. And our next speaker, Ilya Kalinin, uh, 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 the High School of Economics, uh, the Smolny College of uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, his paper is uh, entitled Journey from Petersburg to Moscow or on the normalization of transgression. Ilya, the floor is yours. Uh, Ilya, thank you so much for the presentation, Irina. Thank you for the invitation. The name uh, is a reference, the title of my paper is a reference to Radishev's um, text. Uh, uh, he's also raising the problematics that I'm interested in, everything that has to do with uh, the correlation of culture uh, and violence uh, and the transgressions between the two concepts. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that I want to research, the phenomenon of transgression. I'm going to say nothing on Radishev's text. Uh, I'm going to talk about the two cities uh, uh, that I've uh, referenced uh, in parentheses uh, because, uh, well, I'm going to talk about St. Petersburg and Moscow as uh, the fundamental socio-cultural symptoms uh, uh, going back to the 90s uh, uh, and the beginning of uh, the 2000s, the turn of the century and uh, the 10s. Uh, you know, given the differences, uh, within these two decades, uh, 2000, 2010, uh, um, I've seen this uh, as uh, this uh, gradual um, 
evolution of uh, trends uh, that intensify and crystallize over time. I'm going to s talk about St. Petersburg as the capital of the 90s and Moscow is the capital of the 2000s. Uh, in the same sense uh, as uh, Walter Benjamin is talking about Paris as the capital of the 19th century. Uh, the question, the matter of transgression to me is going to be important, uh, uh, looking at the, the correlation between culture and violence and how these uh, correlations would be differently distributed uh, in the last decade of uh, uh, the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st century. I'm going to be talking more about St. Petersburg. Uh, I'll get to Moscow only towards the very end of my presentation, uh, not because St. Petersburg is the city I'm from, uh, this is the city that I'm from now, uh, as uh, Mr. Petigorsky uh, said, this is the city I'm connecting from. Uh, I have participated in the bathhouse readings before. Um, I'm going to be talking less about Moscow because uh, this relationship between uh, Moscow and violence uh, is, there's a whole book on it uh, by Yimpolsky. Uh, St. Petersburg uh, was the capital of the 90s. Uh, there is no local patriotism in the statement. Uh, as somebody who lives in St. Petersburg, you could suspect that, but that's not the case. Uh, I'm just replicating the discourse of the time where Moscow being the center of the political, the economic and the financial uh, and cultural and criminal life uh, continued to be uh, in the background, uh, St. Petersburg uh, incorporated the alternative uh, to the center and it was starting to play this role of the double, the shadow uh, with uh, the collective perceptions of a new life in a new country with a new economics. Uh, this is something that's observed uh, as sometimes of this projection is uh, the symbolic nominations that we observe in St. Petersburg uh, that define uh, it back in the time either as a cultural or a criminal capital of Russia. A few words on the genealogy of the definitions of St. Petersburg as a criminal capital of Russia. Uh, it wasn't just uh, the criminal um, rates, uh, but uh, these uh, very uh, loud murders uh, and the need to localize uh, the diagnosis of the historical time, uh, localize it within a specific uh, geographical point and reduce the threat uh, that uh, everybody was uh, uh, faced with. Uh, the vice president of the city, Mikhail Manevich, was killed. Uh, in 1998, uh, Stary Voitsova, the deputy of the State Duma, was killed. Novoselov, uh, uh, in 1998, uh, more than 200 uh, ordered murders uh, were committed, a record figure at the time, uh, even compared to Moscow. Uh, with the second definition as the cultural capital of uh, Russia, everything is even simpler, more straightforward. It's uh, genealogy. Uh, if we don't take the historical associations of St. Petersburg with high culture, it's rather comic. Uh, uh, for the first time, uh, St. Petersburg was called the cultural uh, capital of Russia by the first president of Russia, um, Boris Yeltsin, when he was uh, um, uh, making the culture channel uh, as uh, the, the St. Petersburg uh, uh, channel, giving them the frequency. This correlation, in my opinion, uh, should be tackled not in this either or logic, either cultural or criminal state of Russia. Seems like two things are incompatible as genius and evil. Uh, a different logic can be uh, applied to the logic of conjunction and and it's both a cultural and a criminal capital. The simplicity with which these contracts in terms uh, uh, were reaffirmed in the cultural discourse of the 90s the uh, intensity of uh, the symbolic uh, reproduction, the objectivation and uh, mass consciousness, uh, which started to perceive uh, uh, St. Petersburg as the actual embodiment of uh, both uh, concepts, uh, can be explained uh, via the mythology. Um, back in the 70s, uh, we saw this in literature from the Moscow philosopher Vladimir Toporov uh, via the concept of uh, the St. Petersburg text. Uh, by confirming this uh, meaningful unity, Toporov uh, defined this as a St. Petersburg text. Uh, he indicated uh, um, its antithesis and antinomity. This uh, antithetic nature had to do with uh, the synthesis uh, of the mythos of the creations and the eschatological myth uh, that merged. Uh, uh, I'm summarizing Toporov's concept very briefly here. The opposition that we're interested in, uh, the cultural slash versus uh, the criminal capital, uh, becomes the direct continuation of this uh, uh, antinomic axiomy of the St. Petersburg text. Uh, and in this case, we're associating culture with uh, the creative element this, and the criminal with the apocalyptic uh, termination of uh, the world order. 
in the same way as the analytic construct of the St. Petersburg text is not uh, uh, created in St. Petersburg, but in the other center in Moscow. This is where the media discursive center of the post-Soviet Russia was uh, that signified uh, the St. Petersburg of the 90s as two competing um, nominations, uh, both as a cultural and a criminal capital of Russia. In this case, I'm not interested in the uh, empiric accuracy of uh, these nominations. I'm more interested in the cultural mechanisms uh, uh, that make us territories a uh, certain time dominance and fix them to a certain locality. A space uh, that becomes both the poison and the antidote at the same time. Derrida interpreted the antique phenomenon of pharmacon. Uh, in this respect, it's relevant to uh, looking at the oxymoronic nature um, of the concept, uh, which is both a medicine and a poison. Uh, but this logic, uh, the logic of conjunction and and, uh, is also rather superficial. We can uh, look deeper into this opposition between the cultural versus the criminal capital and try to identify something that was characteristic, the structural homology between the cultural mechanisms and the criminal mechanisms that were at play in the 90s. Uh, so, in the 90s, uh, the city metaphor uh, was St. Petersburg, um, which had two titles, uh, the capital of uh, crime and the capital of culture. And it was a contradictive uh, way of marrying two concept. Uh, St. Petersburg was the other and uh, St. Petersburg turned out to be a place of uh, uh, coming back uh, to the screen that reflected the subconsciousness of the transition period. This transition, this borders uh, between the cultural and the crime domains uh, was uh, um, associated uh, with something that violated uh, the natural boundaries, but at the same time it was significant, semiotic as any border transgression. And this is what Lotman wrote about extensively. The moment of transgression, the violation of boundaries was inscribed in each of the domains, both cultural and criminal. Culture was perceived as a sphere of meanings and forms that did not coincide with the needs uh, uh, of this mundane consumption as a way of reproducing the differences uh, that uh, worried uh, the normality of everyday life, uh, uh, which is always based on normative taste, style, prestige models, uh, keeping the political status quo, uh, etc. Uh, moreover, uh, this uh, division uh, of uh, the spheres of influence uh, also had to do with this uh, transgression and that multiplied violence uh, within culture and within crime. This mobility of internal boundaries, uh, the transgression of boundaries uh, was characteristic, uh, uh, was a characteristic feature of uh, the time. I will just uh, briefly list uh, the levels uh, at which uh, transgression would occur between uh, culture and crime. It's easy to start uh, with the characteristic stylistic uh, engagement of the society of the 90s, the criminal subculture from uh, fashion to uh, professional trajectories. And we saw this in the sphere of cultural consumption, the, the oral tradition, uh, which incorporated uh, uh, prison slang uh, uh, into a business talk, uh, reflected uh, this criminality of the new elite. Uh, uh, we can go back to the media uh, commotion around uh, crime, as Mark Galeotti wrote in his recently published book, uh, uh, Russia Super Mafia. It's a national, it turns into a national sport and an object of admiration. Uh, and you can see that in the ratings of uh, criminal bands uh, that uh, the independent newspaper published in December 1996. Uh, Another example from uh, a bit earlier uh, in Asa, the famous film uh, from uh, 87, they preempt uh, this uh, um, merging of uh, crime and culture in the late Soviet society, um, approaching this crisis of differences that Girard was writing about, uh, going back to our first paper today, just a small allusion. The prototype of the main criminal there, played by Govorukhin, was um, a, a character who started a literary career and this is indicated in the titles at the beginning of the film and in the film itself uh, the, the, there's a constant intertwining of cultural and criminal elements on the one hand it's a criminal authority on the other hand we're talking about uh, the artistic underground it's the Yalta in the winter all of the interiors uh, were taken from St. Petersburg apartments uh, where uh, the new artists uh, lived uh, um, those uh, were part of uh, Timur Novikov's group uh, 
the parallels between the criminal and the cultural world were intensified uh, by Nathan and Endelman's uh, book references. Um, again, uh, the entire theme evolves around uh, the killing of the Tsar in St. Petersburg. The, uh, the criminal culture turning into mainstream uh, also takes us back to the economic uh, correlations between high culture and the criminal world, uh, starting from personal friendships uh, between uh, uh, some leading cultural figures with criminal authorities uh, and coming to the financing of a lot of uh, cultural initiatives uh, by uh, criminal capitals. Uh, there were also some uh, iconic uh, TV projects uh, back in the day that uh, would uh, you know, be staged in St. Petersburg, uh, the uh, street of uh, uh, the broken lights and the badened St. Petersburg uh, TV series. A lot of these uh, plots uh, thematized this correlation between culture and crime. The entire first season of the band in St. Petersburg was devoted to a, a, a Rembrandt's painting that was stolen from the Hermitage. Uh, and uh, this correlation is also part uh, of uh, this uh, street of uh, uh, broken uh, lamppost uh, where characters uh, with uh, very significant uh, names or nicknames uh, like Larin and Casanova, very literally references. Uh, St. Petersburg is presented as this aesthetic uh, um, ideal object uh, of admiration. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, really traveling uh, shots, uh, uh, these uh, melancholic uh, spaces, the ruins of St. Petersburg. Uh, and within these spaces, uh, uh, we see this um, macabre landscape uh, of uh, uh, internal like streets and courtyards of where all of this uh, crime, hardcore activities uh, uh, in the 90s uh, uh, play out. Another interesting example of uh, this uh, new correlation between crime and culture that uh, indicates that they are the same, the, the different sides of uh, the same uh, story uh, is a, a set of postcards uh, that um, SPS uh, published uh, in 2002. The Legal Council of St. Petersburg uh, published some postcards with views of uh, St. Petersburg uh, with streets and the prospects and the embankments and the squares. Uh, not always coinciding with uh, this uh, typical way of representing these uh, postcards with St. Petersburg, but nonetheless, uh, these were essentially aesthetically very beautiful views. Uh, but on the other side of these postcards, you would read that these are the places um, where political leaders were killed, uh, that that was how the spaces were chosen, like uh, the, the cultural facade and on the other side, on the reverse side of the same postcard, you have these reference to crimes occurring in, in, in these spaces. Those, that's what those uh, postcards objectified. I guess I do have some time. Another characteristic example uh, is uh, the example of uh, the decay of the cultural language norms uh, that criminalizes uh, the grammatical foundations of literary language. Uh, this is uh, the uh, police uh, protocols uh, from this uh, TV series and the Broken Lambs. What we see with language, uh, this criminalization of uh, the grammatical norms uh, uh, this is something that you could compare with uh, a similar deconstruction of literary norms uh, that uh, we observed uh, in Sorokin's text uh, uh, from a bit earlier even. I'll quote, so just to amuse you. We've identified uh, Sergei's corpse uh, was on the floor next to the sofa. It was placed there with its head facing the northwest and its legs to the doors. Uh, uh, the hands of the corpse uh, uh, are along the corresponding knees. One of them is placed on the chest. Uh, there are no visible wounds, uh, with the exception of symmetrical bruise uh, just uh, uh, above uh, uh, a bodily um, in part. Uh, it's impossible to establish uh, the color uh, uh, scheme. Uh, it seems to be a Nord corpse, nonetheless. Uh, uh, there are some items of clothing presence, a white uh, t-shirt, uh, black boxes, uh, there were no photographs made. Uh, the wife of the corpse uh, during the uh, investigation, uh, Mr. Gava was not sober. She was interfering. Uh, she was causing obstruction. Uh, Colin, the investigator, uh, 
an asshole and uh, a bastard. Uh, there were no comments uh, from those present during observation. Uh, Petrov was the one who put together the protocol. This is a text uh, that um, was a part of the daily culture. It was the epicenter. Uh, it's something that uh, could have occurred even earlier in Sorokin's text, a way of deconstructing the literary norms, uh, uh, a way of parody, parodying it. And um, it's not these crossroads between uh, the crime and the culture uh, that's important. Uh, uh, it's the interrelation between culture and criminal practices, which are considered as transgression of norms uh, with the prevailing language uh, of uh, state uh, hegemony, control over cultural traditions and monopoly of violence. Uh, in this case, uh, the state captures this monopoly for legitimate violence uh, uh, from the repressive uh, uh, bodies uh, that uh, regulated the cultural sphere prior. The economical and social practices uh, are treated by Vadim Volkov in his book uh, uh, in this uh, approach. If I was to summarize what he's talking about, there's uh, two points. Uh, uh, the crime grabs this monopoly of taxation from the state, uh, uh, that's number one. And uh, number two, the way of accumulating capital has to do with getting uh, lease payments uh, from various uh, um, production or infrastructure or resources. Uh, the culture of the 90s, uh, what we've seen uh, is that they're grabbing previous institutional monopolies uh, um, appropriated by the state. Um, while the State of the Union was uh, collapsing, Timur Novikov created the new Fine Arts uh, Academy appropriating the previous monopoly for institutional, uh, well, the state monopoly, I mean, or Anatoly Smolovsky, uh, who is climbing on in 1993 on the shoulders of uh, Mayakovsky's monument and symbolically appropriating uh, the, the authority of the canonized poets. Uh, again, it's uh, a way of redistributing the resources. Uh, we could draw parallels with the mechanism of producing new um, artistic forms uh, and the mechanisms of accumulating capital in both cases and not talking about generating something new but about various uh, strategies of deconstructing the old based uh, on the creative uh, reappropriation uh, with uh, this um, uh, violent appropriation we're talking about national economics and capitalizing something that had no market value before uh, with uh, contemporary art so we're talking about uh, various uh, means uh, of uh, collage and bricolage of uh, old traditions and this is what uh, uh, the key characters uh, of uh, the uh, say piece regard steen was doing with sergey kuryakin uh, uh, novikov uh, gryanov uh, Moreau. Uh, they were mixing uh, the classical academic approaches and the western club rave culture when raves were held in abandoned palaces or for it so in Kronstadt. Where these lease payments uh, and racket uh, like uh, in the market, uh, a similar strategy we see. Well, when the authors of uh, this text, uh, Dmitry Prigov, uh, called uh, one of the most ambitious projects, uh, Evgeny Anegin, Pushkin. Um, 1992, the, the essence of the project uh, was about in rewriting the entire text of Evgeny Onegin by replacing all of the epithets uh, either to insane or uh, unearthly. And uh, again, this is a way of uh, appropriating forcefully uh, a part of the classical tradition that uh, is symbolized by Pushkin and Evgeny Onegin in particular. So I'm not talking about uh, this uh, normalization of criminal practices and justifying that. I'm talking about uh, behind some similar mechanisms between criminal practices and cultural production practices. I'm trying to identify some common causes. Uh, uh, in the 90s, the culture of violence um, Culture and violence were interrelated uh, through this uh, initial origin, the transgression, these, uh, uh, this excessiveness. Uh, that remains such despite regular reproduction. So structurally, not only culture was uh, uh, founded on uh, violence, but violence had this creative nature to it. Uh, contemporary artists would violate social and aesthetic taboos. Uh, high classical culture establishments like the opera and the drama theaters uh, continued uh, 
to work uh, uh, against the backdrop of uh, social and economic degradation. So they seemed excessive uh, against the backdrop of what was happening, uh, a cultural reproduction employees like music schools, museums and libraries, and the majority maintained their jobs uh, despite uh, the fact that they couldn't afford a good living uh, with their pay, uh, bandits uh, would uh, violate and transgress the law. We can continue with the list, uh, but both culture and the criminal world were uh, spaces that were based on transgression. And they were constantly transgressing each other's borders as well. Violence emerged uh, as an effect of uh, this uh, transgression. This almost oligarch episode, uh, in the sense um, that uh, the brother Balabanov's film 1997 starts with uh, it captures this interrelation between uh, culture and crime. I'm not going to dwell on it in too much detail. I'm almost out of time. Uh, what the film starts with is that the he, uh, character finds himself uh, um, part of the video. Uh, he transgresses uh, physically the uh, borders. It leads to a fight and violence, but it becomes productive in terms of uh, um, the story evolving. The entire film and him moving to St. Petersburg uh, uh, is based on him walking into this frame of this uh, filming of the video at the beginning. How much time do I have, Irina? Do I have a couple of minutes, Irina? No, unfortunately, you don't. Um, yeah, okay, uh, then let me get to, I'll miss um, everything that I was going to say about politics, so that's okay, and let me get to the conclusion, it's just still take a minute. Uh, the modern situation. In the modern situation, the way I see it, uh, culture and uh, criminality, this transgression of the law, have become uh, uh, normative in nature with uh, specialized institutions behind them, the right style, good taste, uh, corporate consumption, marketing of the state, uh, its uh, repressive uh, uh, apparatus, uh, corruption, which is not just routine, it's become the norm, uh, which is domestified uh, even when uh, satiristically represented like uh, home arrests, etc. And a lot of other series that run on TNT. Violence uh, was a way of transgression between the zones of uh, culture and uh, crime and within the two domains. Now violence uh, is a, an instrument of defending these borders, uh, something that's meant to recreate them. Uh, art should be in museums and galleries uh, uh, and uh, the policy should be with the state institutions and business has to play by established rules. Uh, like uh, the face of these uh, three waves uh, 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 Petro Pavlensky, uh, Pussy Riot, uh, uh, Vaina, that try to transgress these borders. Uh, the the fate of these ways is well known uh, and they serve well to illustrate uh, the way violence uh, now is not the effect of uh, transgression borders uh, but as a tool of creating and setting these borders. Uh, thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Irina, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Colleagues, are there any questions? Andrei Zarin, please. Ilya, thank you so much. That was incredibly interesting and very convincing. I'm not going to um, try to take it apart uh, in detail, which I could do, but uh, I would just like to mention one thing. In your presentation, you kept coming back to this idea that we're dealing with something that's a specific phenomenon, like in the 90s, that's something that came about. Uh, but uh, this uh, correlation between violence and culture is very standard for the 250 years, uh, starting uh, from Schiller's, uh, from Schiller. Um, it's always been like that. It's been like that for 250 years. Uh, uh, transgression and well, we could discuss um, which option we would go for. I, I don't think there is a, a big option, but uh, it's been uh, actualized uh, by this creative act as uh, something criminal, this interest to uh, biblical crimes. Uh, and uh, in the city, which is presented as an alternative uh, in the robbers, this has to do with uh, uh, the, the end of the 19th centuries, all of these uh, uh, state borders. So what we saw before 
is a way of actualizing a very standard basic cultural mechanism of for the modernist era. It's not a strange excessive phenomenon as characteristic for the 90s. Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for this comment. I fully agree with you. Um, this is something that I left out, uh, but uh, perhaps it, it uh, was perceived as an aberration. This uh, uh, interrelation between culture and violence, uh, it, this is a, there's nothing uh, characteristic exclusively from the 90s. Uh, I agree with you in that. It was interesting for me, nonetheless, uh, to try to inscribe this uh, uh, the trend that we observed over the decade in the 90s and uh, the uh, 2000s into the cycles uh, I wouldn't say that it's always been uh, unchanged and constant. Uh, these are cycles or waves uh, where violence uh, emerges as an effect of uh, transgression and where violence emerges as a means of uh, restraining this uh, transgression, stopping it, locking it uh, uh, within certain boundaries. Uh, so in this case, I think the 90s and the 2000s and St. Petersburg is um, uh, the name of uh, the 90s and Moscow as embodiment of the 2000s uh, can be inscribed into this um, cycle, this pendulum. Yeah, well, another interesting point, uh, doesn't mean anything, but this uh, new era of uh, recreating these uh, boundaries uh, starts uh, with the coming of uh, the person from, Kem well, not Camera, from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Andre, this video that you mentioned uh, uh, in the brother, this is a, a direct quote of Antonioni from Blow Up. Uh, yeah, there's lots of illusions, I agree. There's lots of things to think about and talk about. Irina, are there any further questions? Uh, Evgeny Panamarov? Oh, you're muted. Evgeny, could you mute yourself, please? Evgeny, right. I have uh, two considerations. Uh, when you were talking about uh, St. Petersburg as the embodiment of uh, the 90s, uh, I don't think you mentioned that this uh, myth on the criminal capital uh, came about in the 2000s, not in the 90s. Uh, and at the same time, with this myth of the 90s, uh, which is now often quoted by a lot of people, that it was a very you know, criminalized era, it was a very challenging era. I'm not sure that these are living myths. Although, well, it does ask for some kind of sociological research. This was uh, created in the mass consciousness uh, by these uh, criminal series, uh, soap operas uh, set in uh, St. Petersburg. They started to appear in the 2000s. Uh, uh, well, they started to appear at the end of the 90s, in fact, uh, but at the beginning of the 2000s, these are the main seasons of all of these uh, uh, series. Um, and as far as I remember, the federal authorities, uh, uh, we didn't have many from St. Petersburg, but this mass migration of uh, uh, federal uh, leaders, uh, um, this is something that also occurred in the 2000s, uh, people coming from St. Petersburg. Uh, these are the two considerations that I wanted to share. I don't think uh, this is something that was coined in the 90s. And the second point, uh, when uh, you talk about merging uh, culture and racket practices, uh, I think you're trying to merge a very different uh, um, concept. Okay, somebody climbing on top of the uh, Mayakovsky's building. Well, that's fine. I don't see any racket. Or I think uh, the... I, I don't see this as a uh, racket mechanism and violence. Well, racket is a mechanism of violence for me. If you talk about mechanisms of violence uh, in uh, artistic practices in the 90s, uh, I would first and foremost talk about Alek Kulikov's uh, Sabakiana, when uh, Kulik uh, was naked, running out of uh, um, a dog kennel, starting to bite uh, the uh, visitors of uh, an exhibition. and. Uh, these icon destruction by Turgenian, I think that was his name. These, this is where I see the um, uh, the practices of violence as more relevant. Uh, the, the, the examples that you gave is more about art. Uh, yeah, let me answer. 
just on the the substance matter this is something that i investigated in in the discourse of the 90s the 90s specifically this is where this definition of the criminal capital comes about uh, in the 2000s uh, they started to criminalize the 90s overall uh, um, in order to uh, create uh, its own myth uh, on the era of stability that followed in the first seasons of these uh, series I was talking about, so the streets of the broken lamps, they came about uh, um, as a way to uh, translate uh, this discursive uh, unconsciousness into a crystallized uh, uh, formula of uh, TV representation this is going back to this uh, criminal capital a definition that emerged in the 90s in terms of people moving to moscow this is what i meant uh, people moving from st petersburg that actually happened in the second half towards the end of the 90s they started to move to moscow and uh, following which uh, we enter a new era i'm not saying that they moved and then that started a new era these are just symptoms but nonetheless uh, and we start to set the boundaries so uh, new because in the 2000s so Moscow by Zildovich uh, comes out uh, this is a new name to a new era and Sorokin's uh, script uh, screenplays uh, the Moscow situation is perceived uh, as an era of non-distraction remember this uh, main character all of these post-soviet 90s uh, uh, are these uh, Thor dumplings uh, and all of the houses like uh, digested uh, cutlers uh, and they're trying to alleviate uh, all of the binary oppositions and Lev, the only surviving character, marries two sisters at the same time, this ultimate uh, elimination of opposition at the end of the novel. And uh, against this backdrop of uh, indifference, of lack of differences, uh, uh, these uh, thought dumplings and um, cutlets, this is where we see the emergence of uh, the new clearly defined boundaries uh, that I, I'm seeing Mark so this is not something that has to do with the tricksters and uh, now going to the point that you made about merging uh, distant abstract ideas uh, um, just as Lomonosov I love abstract ideas and uh, the metaphor I think is a great analytical tool what I mean by racket a racket is uh, uh, capturing uh, the rights from the state to um, collect taxes. It, these are just taxes. This is just a definition, Evgeny. Uh, this is just uh, going back to the dictionary of, uh, of foreign words. Uh, we have Mayakovsky, we have the state. Uh, who can uh, uh, get payments uh, from Mayakovsky? The school, uh, museums. So this is a symbolic tax uh, which is monopolized by the state as their right uh, to. Um, get this symbolic taxes from Mayakovsky. Uh, Smolovsky, what he does, uh, he climbs uh, on uh, Mayakovsky's shoulders, appropriating the right to collect taxes, the symbolic tax uh, from the figure of Mayakovsky and everything that's behind it. Uh, in this way, he is uh, deconstructing the entire tradition of uh, symbolic capital around the figure so if we are able to make this uh, metaphoric analytical transition uh, from racket uh, as material taxation captured from the state to symbolic taxes taken from the states as well, in my opinion, I think it can be described as symbolic racket in the same way as Prigov is... Uh, constructing the canonized uh, Evgeny Onegin text uh, that he seems to reappropriate uh, via changing the epithets uh, this um, unearthly and insane being inserted into Pushkin's text I guess I'll complete my answer at this uh, Irina I just wanted to ask uh, Carol you wanted to ask something as well didn't you just a second I'll just briefly uh, say why do you think that it's racket uh, and not uh, an attempt to privatize, uh, uh, de democratize culture when you take it from the state uh, and in a way you allow 
individualizing the figures. He, uh, Smolovsky is not appropriating it for himself. Why is that racket? He's doing it for the people. So in a way, it's uh, a way to freely interpret and to build uh, alternative transition uh, traditions. And the second question, I can understand that you did briefly mention it, uh, but nonetheless, uh, taking Prigov as an example, this deconstruction of uh, the Soviet uh, that perhaps became mainstream in the 90s. Uh, as we know, non-censored uh, art would do this starting from uh, the 50s, uh, saying that this was something that was typical for the 90s. I don't think that's quite the case. Uh, privatization or racket, uh, do with it what you will, uh, of uh, official art uh, uh, was something that was uh, evolving over decades. And why are you um, localizing that in the 90s? Uh, Ilya, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, answering your first question. The problem here, when you hear the term racket and you want to see something positive in it, like democratization, let me just explain. Uh, the way I use this term is I'm trying to be neutral. Um, I'm just indicating a certain procedure of uh, reappropriation uh, of taxes. If, for instance, uh, you saw Osmolovsky, who was doing it not for the sake of himself, but for us all, you can turn him into a Robin Hood-like figure, but uh, this uh, relatively criminal, I'm, I'm trying to uh, step away from all of this criminal connotation, this criminal democratic nature is still there. The figure of somebody who is taken from the rich and given to the poor, it doesn't make them less criminal, uh, they're still illegal in their non-normative transgressive activities. Uh, regardless, although, well, you could argue who Osmolovsky is doing it for, is he appropriated for himself or for the people? I, this is questionable, but that doesn't matter. It's a separate discussion altogether. Irina, I would talk about uh, the monopolization of culture by the state, uh, in a certain sense, uh, can be uh, considered a state racket. Uh, perhaps he's even fighting against racket. Uh, it's the state uh, that's performing a racket. So, yeah, well, it depends on uh, the position that you're from, uh, your point of view. If you're from outside the state, uh, if you're an anarchist, uh, then uh, the state's right uh, to for legitimate violence is uh, also a monopolization of violence uh, that suddenly becomes legal and racket uh, terms, it turns into legal taxation. We can ask like, why? Why is the state collecting taxes uh, if, you, if you're not willing to admit the right? Uh, Irina, Mikhail Nemtsev wrote in the chat, a racket uh, uh, cannot be perceived uh, without negative connotations. Uh, uh, this uh, bribery is still illegal. Well, Prigov and Push, did, did Prigov ask Pushkin if he can rewrite the text of Evgeny Onegin? Smolovsky, did he ask Mayakovsky, is that not bribery? Is that not racket? Is that not trying to capture Irina? Well, nobody overruled Pushkin or Mayakovsky. Uh, uh, this is literally game and racket as violent bribery and taken away without giving back. That's something different. It's in a different field. Well, let's let's not pick on words and terms. Uh, yeah, going back to the fact that it doesn't stem from the 90s. Uh, well, I understand. Uh, I, I used acid from the 80s. So uh, we can go even uh, further back. Uh, when I mentioned Sorokin, that's uh, the end of the 70s. That's the 80s. Uh, but what's important here is that these were processes that were a part uh, of uh, the, 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 the system of culture. It was uh, something in the periphery. It was marginalized. Uh, and in the 90s, it became central. It was pulled from the periphery to the center. And uh, this didn't start from 1991 or the 90s, obviously. This is just uh, something that made these mechanisms that were previously on the periphery, they now became mainstream. And this is something that we associate with the 90s in terms of uh, uh, the means of cultural production based on different forms of deconstruction and redistribution of the legacy of classical Soviet uh, or whichever times. Um, 
just as privatization is not the construction of new plants and uh, factories, it's the redistribution, reappropriation of something that previously belonged to the state. The economics of the 90s is based on privatization, not through producing new means of production. And the cultural production in the 90s uh, goes through privatizing the existing versus uh, pre generating something new and then seen before. And the examples that are given are particularly characteristic uh, for, for St. Petersburg, from Novikov to Kuryokhin, in my opinion, this is something that's highly symptomatic. Uh, it, it wasn't typical for St. Petersburg uh, only, uh, Prigov and Osmolovsky, that's Moscow. But I think that St. Petersburg, uh, in a way, uh, condensed, concentrated uh, the, the name of the times. It set the trends. Irina, I'm going to pass the floor to uh, Karola and Mikhail Nemtsev. Uh, but because we see questions in the chat, uh, perhaps wreck it uh, in your understanding, this appropriation of symbolic capital, a more or less universal mechanism for the development of culture. And the next question, that builds on this one. Uh, and the art of collage uh, is also racket, in your opinion, or not? Because, uh, well, advertising makes money on it. Ilya, should I answer now? Ilya, no, it's up to you. I'm just reading out the questions. Ilya, uh, there's a shift uh, in our discussion from uh, um, to, uh, the overall uh, discussion to racket, and it seems like it's uh, central to my interpretation of cultural production in the 90s, so, well, no, it's just one of the examples of how you could describe this reappropriation, which is always uh, tied to transgression and violence. You can transgress uh, without symbolic violence, you can't. So, it's a conceptual metaphor of racket. Uh, I'm not willing to give it up, but I don't want to generalize it either. I don't want to insist that it all boils down to this concept. Uh, otherwise, we'll just get lost in these generic mechanisms of culture that are, of course, uh, inalienably tied to violence. Uh, I would want to stick to the specifics of the 90s and to how they differ to the 2000s. And before we uh, hand the floor to uh, Carola, before she asks a question, I just wanted to highlight uh, that the most important point I wanted to make is uh, that uh, the nature of violence uh, is always a part of culture, but what we see that uh, is based on transgression and now it exists as a way of protecting the borders. Uh, violence is something that needs to retain the boundaries. Cultures need to, to live in museums. Uh, in a museum, you could sing a song uh, about Putin and the godmother, but outside the museum, not allowed. We know what that's going to lead to. The same applies to politics, so elections to the State Duma 1995, uh, they were, mm, this is something that I didn't have time to cover. Just a little point, Irina, Ilya, then we won't be able to uh, give our colleagues uh, the, the, I can guess what you're trying to say. And yeah, if you look at these election campaigns uh, to the State Duma in the 1995, or the Shvili, uh, Juna, Valentin Dikul, uh, this uh, circus powerlifter, uh, and uh, the complots of philosophers and actors and cosmonauts. Uh, uh, we don't understand what it is. Uh, a, a pop concert, acid rave, uh, um, flights to space. C can't quite clearly define what it was. Now it's impossible. When something happens in the Ukraine, when actors become, uh, when an actor becomes a president, Russia sees it uh, as uh, this symbol of complete degradation uh, in the country. They're like, look, they've got an actor who's a president now, so we're laughing at them, we're mocking them. In the 90s, this is exactly what we saw in Russia. We had 500 actors uh, uh, that uh, were you know, looking to get this high position, and everybody got registered, so it was not a problem back then. Uh, Karola, please, you had a question. And then Mikhail Nemtsev, and that's the end of this discussion, because unfortunately we don't have much time left. Don't want to interrupt it now, because it seems like it's very lively. Karola, please. 
Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation, which um, I thought was uh, yeah very nice, not least because it did take me back to St. Petersburg in the 90s, which I experienced as fascinating times, to be honest. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I admit I tried to very strictly keep on the side of culture and did fear um, the side of violence, which was there and crime, and it was noticeable. Um, and and uh, yes. And it was part of the picture. I would very much agree. Um, um, but I just wondered if um, if it might make sense to to introduce a comparative um, note here as well, because it seems to me that this coalition that you have described in very uh, fascinating ways is um, kind of typical for different cities. Uh, at different times. So um, I'm thinking immediately as a German uh, about Berlin in, in the 1920s, uh, Chicago in the 1920s might be, or beginning of the century, uh, 20th century might be another such place. Um, and if you think of the 1990s, um, it seems to me that New York is very much a place like that, where crime and high culture and uh, economics and politics merge in a specific way, and Washington DC as well. And um, all these cities have then tried in the 90s and 2000s to, to yeah, kind of um, put at least crime to the, push it to the side, get it out of the city to a certain extent. It, they succeeded with different means, but um, it seems to me that that Petersburg really fits in well into this picture. Baltimore is another such city, by the way, I would say, and and so it, it might really make sense to to look at these in 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 a conjunction. Um, and the other, yes, as a historian, I'm always interested in the long history of these phenomena, and Andre has already introduced Schiller and and. Um, Thinking about the German literature, Heinrich von Kleist might be another one who really looks at these, um, um, yeah, at, at uh, evolving modernity and what it means for the link between culture and violence. And I think he's an interesting thinker in, in this way. Um, yeah, just, uh, just as a side note, but then I wondered also how. Um, how the long city of Petersburg and Russian literature comes in here. And I'm thinking um, on the one side, um, on the fact that, well, St. Petersburg always has been the impossible city, the unnatural city. Nobody lived there before it was founded by Peter the Great. And, and the city built on, on, on bones, really, because so many serfs had to push these, these trees into the ground to act, actually made it, turn it into, turn these bogs <laughs> of the Neva into a place where you could actually build anything. And, and so there is this long history of, of quite some violence really, yeah, which, which is linked to the founding of the city. And, and I experienced this as much uh, being part of the myth of the city too and 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 the inhabitants they 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 yeah cherish this um, to a certain extent and then uh, Gogol for example um, as as a Russian example of the literature around 1800 um, so and, and being very Petersburg um, so so are there any um, references back to to that history and to that literature I wondered. Um, yes, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'll answer in, in Russian. It'll be faster. Lots of questions that you voiced, so I'm going to try to speed through them. Thank you so much. Uh, this uh, comparison. Uh, could you please be brief, uh, although we, we, we won't have question, uh, time for Mikhail Nimtsov's question. Could you be a, as brief as possible? Uh, Ilya, but there were lots of questions asked. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Okay, so uh, this comparison, this is something that's really captivating, that would be really interesting to do. And 
definitely different cities, the Berlin of the 20s, uh, New York uh, or Washington. Well, New York, I think it would be in the 90s. It would be the 80s uh, before Giuliani, perhaps it would be more relevant uh, because, uh, well, Giuliani does rebuild these borders, like culture is going to be in the clubs, uh, the crime, we're going to fight against crime. I think he's setting the borders in this sense. Uh, but yes, this is something that's really interesting. In terms of why I'm more interested in the Russia in the 90s, uh, it was um, a situation when the new regime in economics and politics and in culture collided with uh, this uh, opportunity to privatize uh, things that previously belonged to the state. Uh, both material resources and symbolic resources as well. So in this sense, uh, this uh, the post-Soviet Russia situation in the 90s and the, the, the 2000s is significantly different uh, uh, to what we saw in New York or Boston or Baltimore or Washington, D.C. In, in this sense, I think this is the situation that I need to crystallize. I need to find some kind of a structural uh, homology for this uh, uh, appropriation on the material and cultural level. This is um, the romantic tradition that Andre and you mentioned. Uh, the specifics, it, this is something I just realized. Uh, in the case of this romantic reflections on culture and crime, uh, they, they, they always try to idealize the robber, the thief, this noble the robber that Schiller was writing about, uh, this idealization uh, and um, nobleness, so this element is lacking. The, the criminal bros are hard to uh, idealize, they're aesthetically laughable and etc. What I was curious about is uh, to, to describe whether we can find something common between these uh, criminal figures uh, and the new artists of the 90s. Uh, so this is something that was the key focus. Uh, without this romantic idealization, not the noble Robin Hood, uh, no, just the criminals, the way they were, uh, wearing their sports suits uh, or then the uh, red suits uh, later, jackets. Uh, I, I think that's uh, something that's more interesting for me. And this um, the Toporov's text uh, on St. Petersburg uh, is all about this mythology of St. Petersburg, answering your last part of the question, uh, where crime and culture are intertwined. The entire city is based on violence. It's uh, founded. Uh, although Uh, this is a crime monopolized by the state, that's state violence. Uh, in this myth on St. Petersburg, uh, we're talking about state violence. Uh, later, uh, the historical figure of the revolutionary terror comes into the picture. and But again, they, they appropriate it from the state, uh, this revolutionary terror of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Uh, uh, this is something that we can describe using Girard's uh, concept. Uh, this is mimetic violence. Uh, this is an attempt uh, to uh, build mimetic relations uh, between the state uh, and its terror and the counter state revolutionary terror. That's it. That's all I had. Apologies. Uh, sorry, I feel like I'm really out of town. I'm transgressing right now. Sorry. Mikhail, the floor is yours. Please be very brief. Uh, if you could uh, formulate uh, your question or statement very, very quickly. We're really out of time, Mikhail. I'll be very quick, uh, if I may. Ilya, thank you so much. Uh, this is really interesting uh, and uh, like this uh, view from St. Petersburg and your in uh, interpretation from within of the myth of St. Petersburg. It seems like this semiotic violence and physical violence are not the same thing. Uh, when you talk about uh, somebody uh, exercising wrecker or bribery or some kind of act of violence uh, against someone else, and it's similar uh, to what artists uh, are doing or uh, writers are doing, it's not the same thing in my mind because pain and suffering and fear and trauma that uh, people that are subjected to actual violence go through and the emotions that uh, like uh, a philologist senses when his favorite text is uh, semiotically violated it's not the same thing at all uh, yeah a very brief answer i'll answer you very quickly structural homology that i was talking about is not the same as a substantial equivalence i wasn't saying that it's one and the same thing a structural 
homology, it means that we can identify some similarities and the mechanisms that are behind this phenomenon. But it's not one of I'm not equating one or the other. That would be really odd. It's really strange accusing me of uh, being this idiot uh, who thinks that uh, what was happening in the market uh, uh, in the 90s is the same as we see in the, the Fontanka squats when Novikov and Buryanov were organizing the first rave party. It's not the same thing. I know that. I understand that. Uh, and well, thanks for your question. Mikhail, I think you should highlight this in structural homology. That's exactly what I was going to talk about. It's not equivalent. So, Irina, yes, uh, thank you. Although we're starting to uh, compare cultural experiments and mix uh, actual violence. So this is uh, something that's part of our contemporary context, so let's not parallel them. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ilya. Uh, in a, uh, a few seconds, uh, I'll be passing the floor to our, our last speaker for today, uh, so stay tuned. Um, those watching us on YouTube will be back in a few seconds. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I'm welcoming our final participant, but it's the final but not the least, last but not the least. It's Mark Lipovetsky, Columbia University, USA, Trickster and Violence. Mark, Mark, I'm passing the word to you. Thank you so much. I would be walking the same territory that was ploughed by Ilya in his speech, and perhaps I would be coming across the same answers he got, because I think that Ilya uh, touched upon the theoretical question of, of transgression and violence, the relationship between them. I, and we agree though that uh, the transgression is uh, a very important part of cultural process, modernism and avant-garde in particular. And of course, transgression is has violence as its part, and violence has transgression. And although this, uh, I understand that these spheres, uh, although they inter superimpose, they are dis different. And that's why I will use such notion, those notions as different, not trying to make, to outline them theoretically. But perhaps this question needs a more, more, more attention. From the earliest uh, approaches of understanding of tricksters, folklore and mythological uh, character, we, there, the, it's always was a figure of a relation between chaos and freedom, uh, both uh, constructive and destructive. Of course, chaos is a very uh, ambiguous metaphor. Some scholars think about 
it as a break of social taboos and law, sometimes an undermining of symbolical oppositions. And the third, third uh, type of scientists, they see that they see um, it as a figure of archaic epistemolo epistemology through which the uh, archaic man tries to understand the world around him. And a complex and comic dialectic of chaos and freedom uh, are, can be found in many hairs to this trickster figure, from folklore, uh, fool and clown, to the mo modern tricheur, conmen and imposters. And among the tropes of Soviet and post-Soviet culture, it occupies definitely a very important place. Starting with the book uh, of Fitzpatrick, The Tea of the Masks, 2006, Trickster started to be seen as the most important figure, metaphors of Soviet subject. Although he uh, saw it as a marginal figure, it was not a marginal at all. And it, it is not the Soviet subject that the Soviet ideologists dreamt, dreamt about. And they tried to, and the American historians found in the diaries of 1930s. It's not a subject which is channelizing and internalizing all the new patterns of social and symbolic order. It is the subject that is in search for alternative to the Soviet, always cheating on the system and demonstrating freedom which is not even presupposed, not only allowed. And in the Soviet culture, he represents different models of subversive resistance. And there is always a formula of chaos and freedom behind each of the such characters. Bandit, hello to uh, Ilyusha, Benny Creek, or the authorist of uh, the conmen of Osta Bender, the demons of Bulgakov and Sandro Chigem from Chigem and Benedict Yerofeev's Drunk. All these characters are transgressive uh, to these uh, to this, uh, so norms, social, cultural, but, and their impact can be destructive uh, and can be seen as chaotic, but in fact it is being tinted in the Soviet culture with positive uh, coloring. Mary Douglas uh, was writing about tricks in the, Accelerating sense of freedom from form in general, freedom from form in general. And that rather than accelerating sense of freedom of form in general, if it's some possible alternative. But can be accelerating sense of freedom uh, be an alternative to repression system as such, uh, especially the one that it uses violence in uh, and repression at any necessity, trickster traditionally represents uh, a power of power of the powerless the power of people who cannot achieve their goals through the honest means without conning without self imposing um, impostering without they are doing it with, without uh, ruining the system but exploiting it they are they are you, you, not using violence to achieve um, their goals they are achieving them through other means like irony or cheating etc trickster is always opposing uh, a double a power double that is always stronger uh, but in the so the soviet trickster is the same but in a, a there were different characteristics he is a, par a, a parody of power a double so yet trickster systematically reproduces and parodies uh, and pa parodies this the cynicism of the soviet power but of, of course violence is inherent to this power as well as cynicism but and cynicism is sometimes even co uh, covered the, the most cynics that we know of in the Soviet uh, culture, they are using the models of uh, state terror to achieve their own goals. But trickster is just imitating violence, using the atmosphere of fear, but not uh, withdrawing to violence, drawing to violence. For example, the golden bull uh, by uh, um, uh, the Astab Bender, who was 
uh, who, who was actually revealing the businessman's Karaikas covered activities, business activity. And so he sort of acts as Soviet power. His Bender's uh, investigation uh, also looks in, in the eyes of his victims as part of state terror. Of course, he's not, Bender is as a kind of director of the spectacle of violence. He's not the source of violence. And, and many Soviet tricksters act this way. They are not the sources of power. They are distanced from it, of, of violence. But one of the exam, but the dance of Aprichniks in John the Ter Terrible by Eisenstein, they are concentrating the horror of state terror. But, but there is, it is one of the examples and exceptions because there is no distance between trickster and the power here because they are dancing and they are the source of power, they are Prichniks. In the famous uh, story of Babel King, Benny Creek, who is a bandit, who has fallen in love with the daughter of uh, uh, Milk King. Benny Creek, falling in love, makes a proposition to his further father-in-law, future father-in-law. And uh, he had a, he, and he, the house of whom he uh, raided. I won't read this um, quotation. You can see it in front of it. I better read it. L listen, like Baum. I, when you die, I'll bury you at the first this, uh, Jewish cemetery. I'll place a wonderful monument to you. I'll make a synagogue's uh, headman you. I, I will I will build your companion. I'll get 200 cows for you. I will kill all the milkmen except of you. And a thief won't go along your streets. I, I will build you a dacha. And remember, you will not, not an angel yourself. Who, have, who has forged uh, the, uh, the document in your beginning? It's what's interesting that Benny here, the bandit, uh, correlates the uh, suggestion of heart and uh, his hand, a business proposition and a direct threat. But it's interesting how it's in illogical. Why it starts with the funeral? First he, uh, and, and then makes him a headman, headman of uh, Brodsky's synagogue. He, 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 how he, he will he stop being a thief and then kill all his uh, competitors? All these Ill illogic, Ill 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 illogical traits will disappear if we come from uh, from the we start from the end. If he, we start from the beginning of the career of him bound himself when he forged document, and then he comes, uh, and then he comes backwards. First he'll. <clears throat> And then he comes to the death at the funeral. So first, Benny will uh, will. So, so if you place return it all, all the way around, then the logic will be kept. Uh, Benny is speaking like Messiah. He creates a messianic time, uh, which, by the definition of Agamben, it does not uh, sub, uh, submit to perspective of fusion future, but is always corresponding to now, where imminent and transcendent life and the possibility of uh, salvation are, are inseparable. But this is, he, he is an ironic messiah, like many other tricksters of, uh, of the time, Julio Horinite, Ivan Babichev, or, or for example, Benedict Virafeev is the same. Behind each of them, there is a new vision of new ep epoch, based on a specific formula of chaos and freedom. Of course, they're all tricksters. Of course, Benya looks less than tri trickster than anybody else. He's not cheating on anybody. He's not being transformed. He's immediately a ready-made character. But he, but of course, Thief is a traditional folklore trickster. But he, but he's in his transgression. He, is, he has burned the, poli uh, the police station. But also, the way he uses his language, because he uh, speaks little, but he speaks colorfully. Be, and each phrase of his in, in, in Bible stories is always uh, doubled by the narrator or another character. It's a, it's a biblical rhetoric in a way, sh showing the lack of split between Benny's words and reality. These words are begetting reality. 
and uh, their material and reality is a materialization of Benin's uh, uh, word. Uh, ben, uh, trickster is a messiah of revolution. In in the case of Benny Creek, messianism is, uh, is is connected with a certain type of modernity, uh, connect, uh, which uh, Alia Gerasimov, a historian, calls plebeian, which is uh, a, a, an embodiment of self-organization of the urban lower classes of the 19th, 20th century. The, this is this society has also been been balancing on the verge of law and criminality and always uh, basing on the forms of institutions that are based on physical and uh, corporeal uh, language of uh, social practices and the central and the core role uh, is given to the symbolic uh, uh, violence in Gerasimov's opinion revolution legitimizes and spread all over the society the state of half legality and they gave it um, this they, they gave this um, a character of universal social norm on the, the peculiar nonverbal language developed within the discourseless plebeian society и говоря о советском режиме 20-30-х годов герасим увидит парадокс в том что consciously pursuing a very modernist agenda of large-scale social engineering, and the regime operates on a sustained practice of body politics, so reminiscent of the social practices of the plebeian society. Uh, Babel, надо сказать, всеми силами... Babel has to... Uh, tries to minimize Benny's uh, violence. Uh, the raiders started to shoot in the air because uh, they didn't want to shoot uh, in the living people. But nevertheless, violence becomes an inherent part of his ra race. Horrible beating up of Mendel Creek, the uh, killing of Mugenstein by Safka Butzes, and the killing of Safka Butzes, and finally the symbolic coronation of uh, Benny himself in the story of King, uh, that is uh, uh, that is ending the uh, uh, the funerals of uh, of he, the burials of his victims, and people start to run away immediately, uh, trying to disappear from the place of the uh, crowning. The Odysseus Odysseus uh, stories uh, I read um, uh, as a commentary to Walter Benjamin's to the criticism of violence of 1921 which is where violence ecstatically is uh, seen similar to this divine violence or sovereign violence. As Benjamin is writing, for forms the, of manifestation of divine violence uh, are defined not by the fact that the God himself is uh, using violence in miracles, uh, but, uh, but uh, the, but the uh, divine violence can be seen as exterminating, but, uh, but it always is uh, bl bloodless, it's, it's important. But this violence, says Benjamin, um, uh, is always done not against the living soul of a human being, but against the material parts, the goods, the, uh, uh, the house, uh, the, the, the goods, the rights, the uh, lives, but not against the soul of the human being. Uh, and there is a dichotomy of God, divine violence and juridical violence as well. But coming back to violence, he never, Babel never read uh, Benjamin, and and he never knew that it should be bloodless. But Benedict Krieg, Krieg means uh, a spring or a war in German or Yiddish. He's uh, saving the souls of his victims, uh, and where. There is a limitless power of uh, criminal uh, authority, which is used as a, as a parody. It's a revolutionary messianism. Bible's view is, is changing not a, a revolution. Uh, he, he, he is also very pessimistic, philosophically pessimistic. Uh, he, he, in his book of violence, he writes, well, it is just the sign of the injustice of the world, of the world being ethically out of joint. This, however, does not imply that divine justice has a meaning. Rather, it is a sign without a meaning. 
вот, и несмотря на сомнительный авторитет Жижика, я все-таки держусь за этот цитат. Булгаковский Шариков тоже представляет клебейскую модерность и тоже воспринимается окружающими как новый мессия. Но Трикстер или Шариков? По мнению Жалковского. Gets the role of carnival buffoon. The, his trickster character is supported by Jungian theory. I, I shouldn't be reading. Uh, it's a famous characteristics of trickster from his famous article that appeared in the, in the um, collection of work of 1956, and it's 56, and it's uh, can be seen. Uh, Sharikov. Uh, is uh, imitating big two big meta meta narratism meta narratives uh, the bolshevik meta narratives and the enlightenment human humanism uh, and non-violent upbringing the transformation of an animal through the means of non-violent upbringing and 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 uh, the moment sh And at that moment of violence stops, um, he stops being trickster because he, uh, he stopped being uh, a human being anymore. And he stops being a human and they change him back into the animal state. Whether we can combine trickstership and violence, it's very strange. I can, uh, we can see in Bulgakov's case how the author interferes where he stops a trickster. And his violence is is like a um, red flag. And what we can see, looking at the uh, 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 the violence in terms of reporting and denunciations, it can be seen in many tricksters tricksters uh, stories from Vladimir Gromov, uh, uh, from uh, in the famous article of Adolf Alexopoulos, from uh, to uh, Nikolai Zhostovsky. Uh, Uh, in the, the main character of, of Vladimir Sharov, the Ag Agamemnon's uh, king, kingdom. And here, and now I would want to leave the Soviet and Russian territory and to look at trickstership and violence from the global point of view. This, this um, theme coming up to the surface in the Soviet and post-Soviet times is now become getting a, global significance. We can see that in the film of Joker by Todd Phillips. You, it won a Golden Palm in Venice and it became the most uh, uh, well-sold film for the, uh, for the adults in the history of, of cinematography. Uh, the, in this film, the hero in the, in the makeup of clown ship Uh, he, he became a, a revolutionary symbol. Arthur Fleck, who was wonderfully played by Hawking Phoenix, uh, he's charged with this amazing energy of chaos, uh, which is sh shown in the uh, fists of laughter and violence. Laughter and violence, they're always coming together, but violence always comes to the forte. If I, Arthur Fleck is a trickster, He wants to become it, but he is constantly, uh, constantly is defeated. He never is able to make anybody laugh. His debut as a stand-up comedian is uh, uh, is is a uh, failure because of his hysterical laughter. He can't make children laugh. His fantasy of his uh, love with his neighbor is always uh, is is also a parody of anything. Uh, his mother used to beat him up as a child, and that's why he has this um, uh, these feasts of hysterical laughter. But once Arthur uh, uh, with, uh, draws to violence, uses violence, he becomes a messiah of revolution, But, and which finally becomes, is seen as a delirium. The, the cause of which is the of this is that in neoliberal society power belongs to tricksters themselves the symbol of tricksters in power it was the um uh, comedian shows uh, host Murray Fra franklin played by robert de Niro. he's a master of laughter directed at the losers like arthur 
uh, uh, the same are the, the hooligans from the financial district who are uh, mocking those who live in poverty. And although it's uh, the joke is about 1970s, it's a America of Trump with, cyn with cynical tricksters at power. That is why when Arthur kills Amira on air and it be and it is and this violence comes into the streets into the street violence. That's why it can be seen why Trump is seen both as a uh, grotesque symbol neoliberalism neoliber liber and as a mutineer an insurgent against Washington swamp, what he calls Washington swamp. In my view, Joker can be read as a diagnosis to the contemporary culture, with where the strategy of trickster as a non-violent um, opposition to citizens of power is being exhausted. It, it is a film about that neoliberal strategies has appropriated the strategies of trickster. Uh, and uh, where the question is, uh, and and these societies can uh, these conclusions can be applicable to the political regime now, with the neoliberal uh, trickstership, which is connected. It is connected with the contemporary Russian political system as based on cynicism. Uh, many uh, people wrote about, about it. Gutkov, Ilya Kalinin, Pomerantsev, Kukulin, and many actors of this culture are compared to professional tricksters. Gusenov did it. Vyacheslav Morozov with his co-authors writes that Putin's Russia behaves like a trickster uh, in relation to uh, the West. The, the, uh, these analogies uh, were uh, drawn, drawn to the conclusions formulated by Alexei Levinson, что the development of, of cynicism helps us to avoid uh, terror and violence. But now, the recent event sh shows that trickstership doesn't uh, impend power to in, in, on its way to coming to direct violence. And one has to remember one more characteristic given by Ilya Kukulin, uh, who uh, defined citizenism of the Russian power as messianic, seeing that messia messianic notions about Russia and in the world history in the world's history. Uh, uh, serving the pragmatic um, justification of cynicism in Russian politics today. And that's... But this, as Alia was, was saying, it is always based, all, all was rooted in the culture of the 1990s. We can also say that messianic cynicism in culture and propaganda and politics can be comes across with the aesthetic and cult, uh, cult, uh, uh, the cult of transgression, which reminds of avant-garde and modernist culture, and, and uh, which were, were actualized by the, bandi uh, by the bandit ex uh, 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 bandits experience of the 90s. As the, the evidence of the late year, last years shows the trickster in the center of political system is not an exumerum, but is a spread cultural practice. Trickster cannot be otherwise, or it has to be stopped to stop being trickster. Either trickster is pushing the system towards the self extermination, like uh, what happened to, with Trump, or destabilization is brought, um, is destabilization, it brings to the destabilization and violence. But the, but we, we this can be the poles of the same spectrum, and there can be many shades in between. But on the other hand, the protest uh, tr uh, tr is also use, using trickster form for the non-violent uh, fight against regime. Ilya Kalinin was writing about in in uh, it's a long quotation. But Ilya is present, but I can. 
I, I refer to his most important article and the trickstership of power is imitating the trickstership of the protest movement. One cannot but notice that uh, the, tricks, the trickstership uh, mechanism is in the Pussy Riot Church service and also the coring he he uh, hearings. One can also see how in the hands of Navalny and his co-workers, how trickstership methods become uh, a very powerful form of non-violent pol political uh, struggle. If we can relearn the trickstership discourse today, or we should reject it as a as a as something that was compromised by the power, I don't have an answer to this question, and I think that we should need a special st study for that. Thank you so much. We have, dear colleagues. A little bit. We have over time. We have ten minutes for heated discussion. Who would want to ask us the question? Ilya, would you want? And this uh, this uh, theme continues your own. No, I don't want to ask the question because because I. I'm fully, I fully agree with you. I'm on your side. I'm fully convinced by the analysis you are making and my studies with the, with the figure of impo imp imposter are are sort of in the same uh, in the same train of thought and that, that yours. And I am happy. And a sp special thanks for. And and it's the the fact that you are refer to Benjamin's distinction between uh, divine and uh, non-divine violence. It w works uh, with the help uh, to the to, tra the, to the, make the distinction, the distinction I made between transgressive and uh, protective violence. When I would be reworking on my text, I will my text I will use that. Thank you so much. I have no questions. I wanted to ask a question. I haven't read about the text about tricksters, and I, I was very interested when listening. But can it be that this trickster figure that in the culture has worked as a transgression figure and uh, fight with this certain state violence lately was appropriated by state as such? Yes. The new generation of uh, of uh, politicians, Boris Johnson, they are all tricksters, all the populists. They are working in the system of trickstership. In the case of culture, I think it's it's a big problem because the continuation of the political and aesthetic uh, ideas of trickstership, because because. This is it. Uh, this is a state racketeering of cultures, which we can see in, in nowadays. I, yes, I agree with this thesis. <coughs> I am fully supported. I think, in my view, the fact that trickster occupies the position of power It's one of the characteristics of the contemporary culture, and but not only of it, but of neoliberalism as such. Neoliberalism as political economical order, which has its own its own cultural forms, and uh, correspondingly, there comes a very different attitude towards trickster. He becomes a uh, figure of uh, establishment, and then society. Uh, is now divided into uh, trickster losers and trickster uh, successes who, uh, who are in the, uh, the failures, uh, the failing tricksters and the successful tricksters. If we look at Schnur, 
uh, and he's singing. It's about the tricksters, uh, failure tricksters. He sings about the failures, the losers. They want to be candidates. They want to be presidents. They want to be. That he has an imposter as well. They want, but they can't. They fail. But in their place, they, uh, they, the, the that place is occupied by more successful tricksters. They are not different from them, but they are the same. But they managed to be occupy that place. Uh, and the, this idea of society of people who are trying to continuously cheat on themselves some are, are successful and some are not and in this way uh, he, his character becomes very charming what are we to do with this tragedy uh, with this uh, with this uh, tactics and tragedy they have they have very uh, they have they are not Im immune to violence as a matter of fact but they, they are it just seems, I've always been thinking that tricksters are something that oppose violence. And why Benny Creek is so important, because he shows that there is no immunity to violence in the trickster figures. Coming back to the, uh, the theme of our conference, Car Car Carla wanted to say, I want to read two questions. I will just read something from the net. And you will have the ending questions. And Ilya has raised us as well. Yes. I, uh, thank you for your uh, speech. Do you divide, make a divide between trickstership and cynicism? And if yes, then can can we speak? Uh, that Russian power today uh, is appropriating trickster, cynical tr uh, strategies, not trickstership tra tra uh, strategies. And another question on which anthology, uh, which anthology lies in the ba ba in the basis of tricksters that are coming, bad tricksters of power and good tricksters of uh, protesters. Thank you. And of course, I, I draw a line between trickstership and cynicism. Trickstership means it's 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 uh, 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 trickstership. They, they it's it's a hip hop performative cynicism. It has no uh, it's not it has no pragmatism behind it. It has no calculation behind it. Oh, but of course, trick, trickstership uses cynicism but it lacks its pragmatism but also because we're speaking about the society society of the spectacle and this transformation of cynicism of power which was present in the soviet times into this high hyper performative trickstering uh, spectacles yes we can say that but yeah but about the there is no, and second question, there is no ontological basis. I'm both, I say that both power and protesting move, movements, they are using the same cultural rhetorics that are drawing back <clears throat> to the uh, trickstership. And to, to a certain extent, and in, I can say that in the 90s, it was a very effective cultural instrument. And now it's a big question. Uh, it was it was a very effective social and political instrument, and now there's it's a question whether it's uh, effective, but but yet, yet Pussy Riot and Navalny proved to us that it has big potential. It just has to be newly reinvented. I don't know whether I answer your question. Carol, Car Carola, please. <laughs> very much for your presentation um not least because Ilya was um as, yeah just said he consented fully i'm trying to to build an opposing position somewhat um uh, just so that uh, we we have these sides also in the discussion maybe just yeah and i wonder what when you kind of um describe putin and and also Trump as tricksters. I was wondering, um, I always perceived them 
uh, or Trump especially, I must say, I perceived him as bully and as a clear um, bully who is cynical, who is exploiting, um, who is not paying people who work for him, who is, um, yeah, so, and I wondered where is the line between the bully and the trickster? And uh, I, rem I kind of try to um, think of, of books and literature where, where trickster figures um, are sympathetic in a way. I'm, I don't know, I'm thinking about Ilya Petrov and, and, and other figures, um, Schweik. And there is always some kind of humor and playfulness in there, I find. Um, and respect. There's a, there's a fundamental um, respect for others, even if they are kind of influenced, manipulated in a way, not taken so seriously, the situation is turned around, um, and all of this. And this is something that I am completely missing when I'm thinking of Trump and his policies or the way he deals with other people, um, women especially, but, but also others. And uh, so I wondered, uh, so that's kind of the first question maybe. And the second is, why is it then that decency and morality and solidarity and uh, which would be kind of the, the, the counter uh, characteristics, um, why is that so boring maybe? Uh, so not interesting and cannot kind of um, um, create the same in, uh, sympathy in the same same way, because these are the characteristics, for example, I would associate with um, those people who Ilya characterized as, as really keeping culture running in Petersburg in the 90s um, for no money at all, but they still kind of, yeah, do their service in the galleries and, and in the schools and in, in universities and, and keep the system really running. And, and why is it that, that this gets not the same type of fascination in a certain way and, and its sympathy as, as do these tricksters, it seems. Uh, thank you, Carol. The, 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 these are great questions. Um, so let, let's put Putin aside because it's a different conference. Uh, but, but speaking about uh, Trump, uh, I would say that, that, that bully uh, can be a trickster. And uh, for instance, uh, popular... Uh, American culture has a number of bullying tricksters, right? It, it's sort of a TV drop in, 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 in the large spectrum of films, especially about, about teenagers. Think about, I know, um, Back to the Future cycle. There is this, this, this bully slash trickster. Uh, not very successful, but nevertheless. Uh, and, Jesse uh, James would be yeah. another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so, so so it's it's it, it's not it's not an impossible composition. It is exactly uh, the the sort of the type of the trickster that is has a knack for violence, right? So so I wouldn't say that that's that's contradicts uh, to my logic. Um, and uh, speaking about uh, tricksters, yes, in, in in Soviet culture, tricksters are typically uh, depicted with a lot of admiration. They're, 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 they're looked up. They're, they're, they're depicted as free people in the unfree environment, right? Uh, and that uh, what adds uh, very nice conditions to them. But if we um, look at uh, Shairikov as the trickster too, then then not not uh, too much uh, of contrast would be noticeable in relation to to same Trump and. Um, of course, Trump is horrible and disrespectful. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the one who would be defending him, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but from the standpoint uh, of his followers, he's hilarious, he's funny, uh, he's witty. We, we, we shrunk when we hear his jokes. They laugh. 70 million are laughing, right? Uh, so, so that's, that's, that's uh, a very, very unpredictable effect. And, and, uh, the parallelism between the Joker and, and Trump is quite is not invented by me. I just sort of used it. Uh, why decency, morality, and solidarity cannot be as spectacular as as trickster dog? That's that's the probably the deepest question of contemporary civilization. 
um, when in 1987 uh, Sloterdijk published his critique of cynical reason, he, he wrote there that, that uh, cynicism cannot be, um, that the cynicism is invincible uh, to anything but another form of cynicism, right? That idealism fails uh, when it is confronted by cynicism because cynicism easily absorbs idealism and uses and co-ops it into its own practices, which we see every day when we look at uh, post-Soviet government. Right? Uh, I, I, th I think the problem here is that we are living still, as I said, in the society of spectacle. And therefore we need to, uh, when speaking about cultural forms and political forms, uh, the, the quest is going for spectacular forms, right? Uh, spectacular methods, spectacular methods of presentation, right? Trickstatum is one of the, this, this languages of performativity that is easily read through, right? In this respect, I, I think that what Navalny is doing is, is, uh, is especially stunning because he, as I said, is using lots of methods from the Trickster's arsenal in order to promote the agenda based exactly on the ideals you were talking about, uh, decency, morality, solidarity, etc. So, so, so he, he, he managed to, to find this, this combination uh, and uh, that's that's uh, some kind of the breakthrough, I would say. Well, I believe that's why the Puritans has lost their battle against theaters. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately, I would say. No, так сейчас минутку и я We have two minutes, Ilya, your question and the short answer of Mark. It is not a question, it's a commentary. Do I, do I don't have to, should I interfere or not? Yes. One minute commentary. Uh, it's, it's a commentary that somehow it's being born from your commentary, Irina Dmitrievna. So Mark, it links my uh, speech to what Mark was talking about. If 90s, 1990s, it is it's an appropriation of culture and the society uh, of the mon monopoly of the state, of the rights of the state uh, on, in material production and symbolic production. That, uh, it's uh, the, the new, new epoch, it's like what empire strikes, ba strikes back. It's when state reappropriates uh, the tactics that were born of in the, uh, in, within culture for emancipation from the state of monopoly. And all borders are protected. And what state does? Uh, the, the, state, uh, the state has the monopoly on, the, on who has the right uh, to cross the borders and only the state has this monopoly and nobody else now has the monopoly to cross the borders to transgress the borders and i have a favorite phrase by shoigu of september 1914 when he was asked uh, whether there were a russian army at a, in donbass he said it's hard to look for the black cats in the black room especially Everybody thinks, um, uh, you, you know, he says, especially when it, it's uh, nice and kind and, and, and polite, Shoigu says. So if it's yes or no, how we can de deconstruct this uh, phrase? And for the, uh, for the, uh, how, what can be, in, in, it, it's a trickstering, uh, it is a trickster's uh, phrase where, where he actually pr pronounces two controversial ideas simultaneously. And so uh, this now is a monopoly of the state and you don't know how to reappropriate it back. I, coming back to our conference, this same logic is doubled with the relation in, in the relation with the violence. Ten years ago, more so, or almost ten years ago, we wrote uh, with Birken Boyens uh, the book on new drama and in it we, we tried to prove that in 1990s there was a privatization of violence taking place 
mon the monopoly on violence was was privatized by the state it pri it pri it privatized it as a sp uh, it's uh, as a means um, and now the society privatized it and the new drama was being born was being born on this basis of privatization of society of the monopoly of the state by the society and now we have this, uh, an opposite situation we the protest peaceful protest now is used as a form of violence while well, the state has all the right is entitled to all form of uh, violence with no, with no limit now and now it's like we can say it's like industrialization of violence it's it's very sad to end our conference with such a metaphor and the problematic of violence as we could have seen in the course of the four sessions it's endless and uh, has no limit and we'll be coming back to this it's a very complicated theme and uh, my task is now to to thank all the participants thank you for all your wonderful reports in all days and i'm glad that you agreed to this version to, to, to participate in uh, this online version and after the return to uh, hopefully this return to the normal life will be soon here i thank to all our youtube uh, uh, listeners and viewers and of course we will make a post-production and it will be on the net and it will be and people will be able to listen to something they have missed probably or listen once again and it will be the continuation of the meditation on violence in the modern world but i cannot but say to the people who are behind screens at the, um, it's wonderful technical scream uh, under Pavel Labazov who ensured our communication online without fail. It's, one, it's great translators we had, heroic translations that were translating from Russian into English and back. Um, very complicated texts, Thank, great thanks to them. And my wonderful Anna Lohr, colleagues that without fail in during all those and hours that were online listening helping etc so colleagues thank you so much till the next time next meeting and we as i said we will um issue we'll make a special issue of anthropology, dedicated to anthropologies of violence. And I think it was going to be a very interesting read, intellectual. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues.